In this lecture, we're going to take a moment to understand routing. We've got a big app to develop. Where do we start? What should we focus on first? Every developer has their preference. For me, I like to start with loading the HTML and CSS. Before we do so, let's review some terminology. You're going to hear these words often. Firstly, we should understand the idea of a resource. In the context of web development, a resource refers to a single piece of data delivered by a server. For example, if we request a file called cake.jpg, the resource would be an image. If we requested a page called about, the resource would be an HTML document. So on and so forth. A resource merely refers to the file loaded in our browsers. This concept leads us to the next concept, which is routers. A router is a feature in applications for handling the resources delivered by a server. It's common practice for developers to add routing to their applications. Believe it or not, we've already been using routing since the beginning of the course. Web servers, like Apache, have a basic routing feature that we've seen before. In the address, we're not accessing a specific file. By default, the server has been configured to deliver the index.php file. We have another file called about.php, which we can access like so. If we had an image, all we would have to do is type the path relative to the phpiggy directory in our xamp installation. Our server is able to deliver resources without us having to write additional code. This type of routing is referred to as file-based routing. File-based routing maps URLs to our file system. As long as a file exists in a publicly accessible directory, the file can be accessed. While convenient, there are two problems with this solution. The first problem is the URL. Let's say we had a contact page. The file would probably be called contact.php. At the moment, that doesn't seem like a problem, but it can be a problem in the future. What if our client decides they don't want to use PHP anymore? They may want to switch to a different programming language like JavaScript or c -sharp. The PHP extension is only supported by the PHP programming language. By switching to a different language, we would have to drop the PHP extension. If we were to change the structures of our URLs, search engines would penalize our site. It's always considered good practice to keep URLs consistent for the lifetime of a site. Otherwise, it can affect your ranking in search results. The second problem is being able to handle dynamic URLs. What if the app we're developing has user profiles? We can tie a profile with a specific URL like most applications. Unfortunately, that's not possible with the current server. If a new user signs up, we would have to create a new file for that user. What if we had millions of users? Our system would have millions of files. Creating files on a system is very intensive. Out of the box, Apache and PHP don't provide a solution for addressing these issues. It's up to us to develop a routing system according to our needs. More often than not, PHP developers resort to creating a custom routing system instead of relying on a web server's routing configuration. By doing so, Developers have more flexibility and control over what resources get delivered to browsers. That's going to be our first step with our application. We're going to start developing a router. In the next lecture, let's get started by modifying Apache's configuration. In this lecture, we're going to start modifying Apache's configuration file. As we know, our application is using file-based routing. This routing is handled by Apache. However, it's not ideal. So we must override its default behavior. We're going to tell Apache to let our PHP code handle routing. We can do so through the configuration file. In your editor, open the httpd vhosts.configuration file from Apache. If you forgot where to find this file, you can use XAMPP to help you find the file by navigating to Configuration Browse Apache. Under the configuration slash extra directory, you're going to come across the various configuration files for our server. You should open the httpd vhosts file. Once you've opened the file, let's start updating our configuration. As you can recall, we updated this file to support virtual hosts. You should still be able to find the module at the bottom of the file. We don't want to apply these changes to the entire server. So, 
we're going to apply them from within the container, so that only our virtual host is affected. Inside the virtual host container, add another container called directory. The directory container allows us to apply settings to a specific directory. This is an extra precaution we should take, even though we're already in the virtual host container. After the directory container, we must provide the path. It's the same path passed into the document root setting. Let's copy and paste the value. Inside the container, let's enable the module by writing the following, rewrite engine on. The first step is to enable this module. Enabling this module gives us the power to select a different file for a URL. As a reminder, Apache searches our file system for a file based on the URL. It's performing an exact match. We have the power to tell Apache to use a different file based on the URL, which is what we're doing by enabling this module. We must enable the module before proceeding. Make sure your code matches mine. These directives and their values are case sensitive. Next, let's write the following. Rewrite cons percent request file name exclamation point minus D. Rewrite cons percent request file name exclamation point minus F. There's a lot to go over in these two lines of code. In both lines, we're using a directive called rewrite condition. Before selecting a file, we're going to perform two conditional checks. If we think about it, do we need to handle routing for every request to our server? I don't think so. If the user wants an image or a video, Apache can deliver those types of files. We're not concerned with overriding the routing behavior for simple asset files. Our goal is to apply routing to specific PHP pages, hence why we're creating conditions. These conditions can check if the request is pointing to a specific file. After the directive name, we're accessing a variable called request file name. This variable contains the path to a file after the domain name. It's a variable defined by Apache. Lastly, we're using flags called D and F. The D flag can check if a given file path is a valid directory, whereas the F flag checks for a valid file name. However, we're not interested in overriding the behavior of files and directories in our project. Instead, we want to check if a file or directory doesn't exist, which is why we're adding the exclamation point character at the beginning of the flags to test for the opposite effect. If the URL does not match any existing files or directories in our project, we can proceed to overwrite the default behavior. After these lines of code, add the following. Rewrite rule caret slash index dot php l. The rewrite rule directive can be used to override the behavior of Apache's routing behavior. It has two arguments. Firstly, we must provide a regular expression or path that must be matched. Regular expressions are not something we've gone over. This symbol represents everything in the URL. Basically, we're catching any path with this symbol. If the request is caught by this rule, we can tell the server to run a specific file. In this case, we're running the request through the index.php file. Basically, we're telling Apache to always run the index.php regardless of the path. The last portion of this directive is a flag called L. This flag instructs Apache to stop applying rewrite rules. While not necessary, it's an extra precaution you can take to prevent external configurations from overriding our code. If you're looking at this whole thing confused, don't worry about it. Apache's configuration syntax can be difficult to wrap your head around. Luckily, it's not something we'll be doing often. I promise we'll get back into PHP. Our configuration is ready. To verify our configuration works, let's update the index.php file. Inside this file, call the printr function with the server variable. I'm introducing a new super global variable called server. This variable contains information on the current server and request. This includes the URL. For readability, let's surround the function with pre-formatted HTML tags. Afterward, open the XAM control panel. Our changes won't take effect until we've restarted the Apache module. 
Next, visit the PHPiggy site. As you can see, the site is working as it did before. In the address bar, we can type a random path like so. The same page gets rendered. However, the server variable's contents are different. In this array, search for an item called request URI. As you can see, the server was able to successfully capture the URL visited by us. If we visit a URL for a file that doesn't exist, our server automatically falls back to the index.php file. But what if a file does exist? Let's try accessing the about.php file. Since this file exists on our system, Apache was able to deliver the file. The request is never given to the index.php file. Great! We've successfully taken control of the request. We can use the information from the server variable to help us with routing. If you're interested in learning more about the server variable or mod rewrite module, check out the resource section of this lecture. I provide links to the documentation pages for both resources. In the next lecture, let's look at an alternative solution to rewriting URLs. In this lecture, we're going to look at an alternative solution to rewriting URLs called the htaccess file. The htaccess file is an optional file that can be included with your project for configuring Apache. We'll talk about the differences between the htaccess and main configuration file in a moment. First, let's update our main configuration file. Open the HTTP vhosts file. Apply comments to the rewrite module code. We're temporarily removing this code to focus on the htaccess file. Next, inside the public directory, create a file called .htaccess. The htaccess file can contain directives just like the main configuration file. The main difference is that the configuration from the htaccess file is only applicable to the current directory. To be clear, it's completely possible to apply directives to specific directories from the main configuration file. However, Apache automatically assumes the configuration file from the htaccess file applies to the current directory. We don't need to be explicit about where the configuration should be applied in our project. Let's try adding the same configuration setting we had for rewriting the URLs into this file. I'm going to copy and paste the solution we had previously without comments. Next, I'm going to restart the server with XAMPS control panel. Lastly, I'll refresh the page in the browser. As you can see, our app continues to work like it did before. So, what are the differences between both files? It seems like we can configure our servers through either the main configuration file or htaccess file. First and foremost, the htaccess file does not support every directive. We're limited with what features can be configured through the htaccess file. On the other hand, the main configuration file has complete support for all directives. Secondly, the main configuration file can be applied to the entire server or a specific directory, whereas the htaccess file only applies to the current directory. This feature gives us the ability to apply special configurations to specific directories within our project. Lastly, the main configuration file gets executed once the server is started. This is why we must restart the server when modifying the main configuration file. The server continues to use the original configuration. However, the htaccess file gets executed on every page request. Therefore, we can freely update this file without restarting the server. It can be a great way to experiment with features before committing them to your main configuration files. This behavior can impact the performance of your server. In the resource section of this lecture, I provide a link to the documentation page for the htaccess file. If you scroll through this page, you're going to come across a section called When Not to Use htaccess Files. There are a lot of misconceptions about the htaccess file. In most cases, it's not necessary to need this file. This section goes over additional information on when you would want to use it. In our case, we don't need it. 
Apache gives us the option to disable the htaccess file completely. Before we do so, there's one thing I want to show you. Head back to our project in the browser. What do you think would happen if we attempted to visit the htaccess file? Technically, it's a file available from the public directory. Therefore, we should be able to view the contents of this file. Let's find out. Our server responds with a forbidden access message. Behind the scenes, XAMPP has configured our server to deny access to file names beginning with HT. In fact, you can open the main configuration file to view this code. Open the main configuration file with Visual Studio Code. In this file, search for a container called Files. You should be able to find it around line 300. The files container can be used to apply directives to specific files. Above this container, there's a description explaining what this section of code does to our server. According to the description, our server rejects requests to files called htaccess or htpassword. If you plan on using the htaccess file, I highly recommend adding these directives to your configuration file. The last thing you want is for users to be able to view your configuration file. Alright, but how do we disable the htaccess file? If we scroll above this section of the code, you may come across a directive called Allow Override. This directive can be applied to our project to toggle the htaccess feature. You can set this directive to All to enable the option. By default, XAMPP has enabled this feature. We can disable this feature by setting the value to None. Since we're not going to be using the htaccess file, let's undo the changes applied to the virtual host file. Next, let's restart the server. Lastly, refresh the page. Great! We've successfully disabled this feature. In most cases, I prefer to disable the htaccess file. It's not necessary for most projects. In addition, if you're looking to boost the performance of your app, disabling this feature can be a great way to do so. With that being said, you may come across this file from time to time. Knowing how it works can be helpful. In the next lecture, let's continue working on integrating routing into our app. In this lecture, we're going to define a function to help us with debugging our code. Let's take a look at the index.php file. In this file, we're dumping the contents of the server variable for readability. We decided to wrap the function with a pair of pre-formatted tags. Throughout the course, we're going to be repeatedly inspecting the contents of our variables. It's a normal part of programming. There's one small problem. It would be annoying to have to constantly type these three lines of code. To solve our dilemma, we can write a sugar function. You may hear this phrase from time to time. A sugar function is a function for simplifying a few steps of code. Typically, sugar functions are less than five lines of code. Let's outsource this logic into a sugar function for ease of use. Inside the application directory, create a new file called functions.php. Let's define a function called dd. The name is short for the functions variable dump and die. These functions are going to be called from within the function. First, let's move the logic from the index file over to this function. At the moment, the dump function is passed in the server variable. Let's update our function to dump any value by adding a parameter called value. Update the dump function to accept this value. Lastly, let's call the die function. We're calling the die function to save time. There isn't a point in rendering the rest of the page when a variable gets rendered on the page. We can tell PHP to stop generating the rest of the page for it to load faster. Let's try using our function. Back in the index file, call this function. Let's not forget to include the functions file. Since the file contains functions and not classes, we can't autoload it with the PSR4 standard. We must manually include the file. That's not going to be a problem. It's just one file. 
the path to the file will be the following directory dot slash functions dot php. Switch over to the browser. After refreshing the page, our script continues to function as before. Whenever we need to view a variable's contents with formatting, we can resort to the dd function. Sugar functions are not required, but can make development easy. It's not always necessary to create a class when a simple function will suffice. In the next lecture, let's go back into routing. In this lecture, we're going to start implementing the logic for our router by creating a class. This class will be responsible for registering and dispatching routes. We'll talk about those features in another lecture for now. For now, the goal is to create a router class. This class should be defined from within the framework. Inside the framework folder, create a file called router.php. Set the namespace to framework. Lastly, define a class called router. You may be wondering, why are we defining a separate class for the router? Keep in mind, we want our tools to be standalone. If a developer wants to use the router without the other tools from our framework, they'll be able to do so by initializing this class. Since we're going to be using our entire framework, let's provide initialization from the application class. As a reminder, the purpose of the application class is to make it easier to connect our framework's tools under a single class. If a developer creates an instance of this class, the class should prepare the router. Let's define a property for storing a reference to the router. Define a private property called router. The type will be the router class. Two things worth noting. Firstly, the access modifier is private. We don't want the router to be updated from external sources. Otherwise, it could disrupt the flow of our application. Secondly, the property is the name of the class in lowercase letters. It's a common naming convention for property names to have the same name as the class with camel casing. The next step is to set this property during instantiation. Define the construct method. Inside this method, set the router property to a new instance of the router class. After making those changes, let's try testing our code. Switch over to the browser. If we look at the contents of the application variable, it'll contain the router property. The value of this property is an instance of the router class. We've successfully initialized the router. If developers initialize the application class, they'll also have access to the router. In the next lecture, let's begin adding routes. In this lecture, we're going to begin adding support for custom routes. We haven't had the opportunity to discuss what a route is. Let's define it before moving forward. A route refers to the path to visit a page. It's the portion of the URL after the domain. For example, the route for the home page is a forward slash character. If we wanted to create a route for an about page, the path would be slash about, so on and so forth. The job of the router is to control the content rendered on the page based on the URL. To determine which content to render, it's going to need to contain a list of routes. Our framework should provide a location to store a list of routes. In addition, let's add a method for registering new routes. Let's update the router class to support these features. In your editor, open the router file. The list of routes will be stored in this class. Define a private property called routes. Set the data type to array. I think storing the list of routes as an array makes sense. After all, applications can have more than one route. Let's set the initial value to an empty array. Next, let's define a method for adding routes. At the moment, the array is private. A single route must contain a few pieces of critical information. Otherwise, we won't be able to render the correct page. We can enforce the structure of our array by using a method. Using methods to update arrays is very common, especially if you want the array structure to contain certain pieces of information. Below the property, define a public method called add. In the parameter list, add a string parameter called path. 
Inside the method, let's push a new item into the array. The value will be another array. As I said before, a single route will need a few pieces of information. A multi-dimensional array will suffice for our needs. This array is going to contain a key called path. Its value will be the path argument. Other than the path, we're not going to add anything else. I know I said a route is going to contain a few pieces of information, but there are other topics that will need to be covered before we add them to a route. For now, all we need is the path. Great, we've got a method for adding routes. If developers use the router alone, they'll be able to use this method. But what if they're using the application class? Let's take a look at this class. The property for storing the router is private. Therefore, new routes can't be added. To fix this problem, let's define a publicly accessible method. Inside this class, define a method called add. Next, in the parameter list, add a string parameter called path. Lastly, call the thisRouterAdd method with the path argument. Essentially, the application class acts as a layer. This is one of the consequences of using private properties. If we wish to invoke methods from an instance stored in a private property, we must define another method for doing so. I think it's worth it to prevent developers from overriding the router property. Let's try testing our work. Open the bootstrap file. After creating the application instance, let's call the add method. For our first route, register a route for the home page, which will be a forward slash character. Why a forward slash character? As a reminder, we dumped the server global variable. If we visit the root URL of our site, the path is set to forward slash character. Therefore, the path for the home page will always be this character. Let's call the dd function with the app variable. I want to inspect the contents of the class to verify the route gets added. Before testing our work, open the index.php file. In this file, we're dumping the application variable. Let's remove this line of code. Next, refresh the page. Nested inside the output, you will be able to find the array of routes. As you can see, our single route was added. In the next lecture, let's add one improvement by using HTTP methods. In this lecture, I want to get into a discussion on HTTP methods. The path is not the only piece of information critical for our router. There's other information to take into consideration. HTTP methods are going to be helpful. Before we talk about HTTP methods, let's talk about a potential problem with relying on a path to generate a page. We must ask ourselves, how do we name our routes? At first glance, it might seem simple. As an example, let's say we wanted to register a route for viewing a user. Possible names could be get user, grab user, or retrieve user. What if we're developing an app in a different language? Our paths would probably reflect the language. There are so many ways to name our routes. We may want to use the word get, but another developer may think it makes sense to use the word retrieve. The problem can compound when we're working with multiple projects. One project may use the word grab, and another project can use the word get. Luckily, there's a common practice found among developers. The route path must describe the resource, not the action. Since we're trying to grab a user, the name of the route should be called user. However, that leads us to another problem. How do we know what action to perform on the resource? We may want to update or delete the user. Regardless of the action, the path must always be called user. A lot of data gets exchanged between the browser and server. If we were to simplify the communication between a client and server, we would have two key components. Firstly, we would have the request. Whenever you visit a site, the browser sends a request to the server. The request contains information such as the URL, your IP, the browser you're using, the type of method, etc. Browsers automatically handle configuring this information. 
You don't need to do anything on your part for the browser to send this information to our server. From there, the server processes the request and sends back data. This is known as the response. One piece of information sent by the browser to the server is the HTTP method. The HTTP method is a piece of information from the request to describe the type of action that the server should perform on the resource. In the resource section of this lecture, I provide a link to a list of HTTP methods. As you can see, there are quite a few options available. We have methods for creating, updating, retrieving, or deleting resources. You should always pick the resource that describes what you're doing. Going through the list of methods can feel overwhelming. Luckily, there are methods more popular than others. You're unlikely to use them all in a single application. The get method is used for retrieving a resource. The post method is used for creating or updating a resource. Lastly, the delete method is used for deleting a resource. If you were to look at the documentation, you might find that it recommends the patch method for updating a resource. For small to medium sized apps, many developers prefer the post method for creating and updating a resource. Typically, a method should describe a single action, not multiple actions. However, if you're developing a small application, it's perfectly fine to just use the POST method for both types of actions. It's more common than you think. Choosing the right method is important. It can help you understand what will happen to the resource when using a specific method. By default, browsers set the HTTP method to GET. It makes sense when you think about it. Whenever you visit a page, you're asking the server for a document. Retrieving a resource is commonly associated with GET methods. We can verify the method by using the developer tools. On your keyboard, you can press F12 to open the developer tools for your respective browser. You may already be familiar with these tools. They are mainly aimed at front-end developers. However, back-end developers may benefit from them from time to time. We're going to focus on the network panel. If the panel is empty, you may need to refresh the page. This panel displays a list of files requested by a browser. One of the requests should be for the home page. Looking closely, the request has been marked as a GET method. If you're using Chrome, you may not have this column available. To view a complete list of information sent by the browser, you can click on the request. Under the Headers tab, you should be able to find the request method. Now that we understand what a request method is, I think it would be a good idea to start using the request method. In the next lecture, let's update our router to accept HTTP methods. In this lecture, we're going to store the HTTP method for our routes. First, we must update the add method in the router class. This method is responsible for adding new routes. As mentioned before, there are various methods available. We shouldn't assume the method to apply to a route. Let's add a string parameter called method as the first parameter. Next, inside the array, add a new key called method. The value for this key will be a function called string to upper with the method parameter. Method names are case insensitive. It's not uncommon for method names to be in all lowercase or uppercase letters. For consistency, we should enforce a specific format. In this case, we're going to use all uppercase letters. The string to upper function is defined by PHP. It accepts a string and returns a string where all characters are uppercased. After making those changes, our application class must be updated. Let's open this file. Inside this class, we have a method called add for calling the add method on the router instance. For convenience, let's update the method name to get. As we build our application, we're going to be registering a few routes. Most of them are going to be routes with the get method. Repeatedly typing the method name can feel exhausting. Rather than defining a generic method for adding a route, let's update this method to register a route with the get method. It's going to result in less code. Inside the router add method, Let's set the first argument to get. If we ever call this method, the HTTP method will always be set to get. 
since we're changing the name, we'll have to update the bootstrap file. Replace the add method with the get method. Lastly, we can test our work by refreshing the page in the browser. As you can see, the method key appears in the array of routes. We've successfully added the method to our routes. In the next lecture, let's continue working on the route registration of our router. In this lecture, we're going to normalize the paths for our routes. At the moment, we're accepting any type of path in our application. However, developers may format their paths differently. These differences can create inconsistencies. As a result, we can have unexpected behavior. Take a look at the following example. Let's say we were registering a route for an About page for team members in our company. There are different ways of inputting the path. Do you see the problem? We have inconsistent paths. Inconsistency can lead to issues with finding the correct page to render. To avoid this issue, we can perform something called normalization. In the programming world, normalizing a value is the process of updating a value to have consistent formatting. Standardizing values can be a great way to have consistency. In our case, we're going to normalize our paths by adding forward slash characters at the beginning and end of the path. Of course, you're more than welcome to normalize the paths differently. However, this is the most common format applied by routers. Normalizing paths is a job for our router. In your editor, open the router class. Let's define a method for handling this process. At the bottom of the class, define a private method called normalizePath. In the parameter list, let's accept the path to normalize by adding a string parameter called path. Next, let's set the return type to string. Our method is going to return the normalized path. Inside this method, let's set the path variable to the following slash path slash. As you can see, all we're doing is adding the forward slash characters to the beginning and end of the string. Let's return the variable. We're not finished yet. There's a possibility the original path already has these characters at the beginning or end of the string. If that's the case, we're going to have excessive slash characters. To prevent that from happening, we're going to remove the slash characters from the original string. It may seem redundant to add and remove them, but it's better to be safe than sorry. We can remove excessive characters by running a function called trim. Before adding the slash characters, let's set the path variable to the trim function. If we hover our mouse over this function, Visual Studio Code provides a description. According to the description, this function can be used for stripping characters at the beginning and end of a string. It's the perfect function for our case. There are two arguments. First, we must provide the original string. Let's pass in the path variable. Next, we must provide a list of characters to remove. Let's pass in a forward slash character. After making those changes, we can start using our method. In the add method, let's set the path variable to the this normalize path path method. Let's test our work. Refresh the browser. If we look at the array, things aren't working as expected. The path for the home page has excessive slashes. In the next lecture, let's resolve this issue. In this lecture, we're going to briefly talk about regular expressions. They're going to help us solve the problem with the normalized path method. If we look at the path key for the home route, the value has two forward slash characters. I think it makes sense as to why we received this outcome. In our code, the route for the home page is a single forward slash character. The trim function removes this character, which leaves us with an empty string. Afterward, two forward slash characters are added to the path. As a result, this value gets produced. There are different ways of tackling this problem. One solution would be to use a conditional statement. That can work, but it only works for a single path. What if we end up having another path that could produce this error? Ideally, we should have a solution for removing duplicate consecutive forward slash characters from a string. 
This type of scenario seems ideal for regular expressions. From time to time, you're going to encounter regular expressions. They can be really intimidating. Nonetheless, they're important to know. In the resource section of this lecture, I provide a link to a list of string functions. It's common practice for developers to manipulate strings. We can perform actions from replacing characters to shuffling them. However, PHP can't account for every action you'd like to achieve. Sometimes, you may need to apply patterns on a string. For example, let's say you wanted to validate a credit card number. Credit card numbers follow a specific format. None of PHP's functions can help you validate this type of value. In that case, you'll have to use a regular expression. So, what is a regular expression? A regular expression is a pattern that can be applied to a string. The regular expression finds matches based on the pattern given. Patterns can be anything we want. They're an extremely powerful feature in the programming world. You heard that right. Regular expressions are not specific to PHP. You'll find them in most programming languages. I won't lie. Regular expressions are difficult to learn. There are books dedicated to teaching them. Their syntax is very bizarre, even to experienced developers. Luckily, regular expressions are popular, so you shouldn't have a problem searching for an expression for your specific needs. In the resource section of this lecture, I provide a link to a site called Regular Expression 101. This site is a tool for creating regular expressions. You can use it to test an expression before adding it to your application. At the bottom right, the tool gives some examples of patterns you can use. Feel free to look around. Before we start writing an expression, we must select a flavor, which refers to the programming language. Regular expressions exist in most programming languages, but each language may implement regular expressions differently. From the list of options, make sure the PCRE2 option is selected for PHP regular expressions. Next, let's provide a test string. Let's input two forward slash characters. The goal is to write a regular expression to detect two or more of these characters. We can consider our regular expression to be valid if it can match these characters. Afterward, let's set the delimiter. Similar to strings, we must indicate the beginning and end of a pattern. Strings use single quotes or double quotes for opening and closing a string. Regular expressions use a different set of characters. These characters are referred to as delimiters. PHP supports various delimiters for regular expressions. The most popular delimiter is a forward slash character. However, I've encountered problems with this character. For that reason, I prefer to use a hash character, which is almost as popular. I recommend using this character over the forward slash character to reduce the likelihood of an error. After selecting the delimiter, let's begin writing our expression. Type the following in the regular expression field. Left square bracket slash right square bracket. The first step to writing a regular expression is to write a range of characters to select. The range of characters must be written inside a pair of square brackets. At the moment, we're only interested in the forward slash character. Additional characters can be added by typing them inside the brackets. For example, let's say I wanted to also select the letter A. After adding this character to the list, I'll replace the test string with this character. To the right, there's a section called Explanation. I highly recommend reading through this section to get an understanding of our expression. Looking closely, the explanation provides a list of characters from our expression. Below this box is a list of characters found by the expression in our test string. As you can see, it was able to find the letter A. I'm going to revert the expression and test string to their original values. So far, so good. There's one minor problem. If we look at the list of matches, the expression was able to detect the forward slash characters. Multiple matches were found. Regular expressions don't search for a single match. They'll always find all possible matches in the entire string. It's detecting both slashes as independent matches, which isn't what we want. If we look at the explanation, the expression starts to make sense. The explanation states our regular expression selects a single character. Hence why we're receiving these results. Ideally, 
it should be able to select groups of two or more forward slash characters. To get the desired behavior, we can instruct the expression to select consecutive characters by adding the following, left curly bracket, two, comma, five, right curly bracket. We can select consecutive characters by adding a pair of curly brackets after the square brackets. In these brackets, we can specify the minimum and maximum occurrence. For this example, we're selecting occurrences between 2 and 5. If we look at the list of matches, our expression was able to select both characters instead of a single character. It's exactly what we want. Our regular expression is ready. There's one more thing we can improve upon before using it in our application. It's optional to set the maximum threshold. We can remove it like so. After removing the maximum threshold, the expression continues to work. According to the explanation, the match is performed when the characters occur between two and unlimited times. That should cover most use cases. In the next lecture, let's use this regular expression in our application. In this lecture, we're going to use regular expressions in the normalized path method of our router class. PHP has a few functions for performing regular expressions. In the resource section of this lecture, I provide a link to a list of these functions. Right away, you're going to notice one thing. All function names start with the word preg, short for Perl Regular Expression. Regular expressions have existed since the 50s, long before PHP was even a programming language. During the 80s, Perl was a popular programming language. It became very popular because it implemented regular expressions better than most languages at the time. While Perl isn't as popular as it used to be, modern programming languages were influenced by its implementation of regular expressions. This includes PHP. PHP mimics Perl's implementation of regular expressions, which is why the name of our functions are called Perl Regular Expressions. Alright, enough of the history lesson. It's time to use these functions. In your editor, open the router class. Inside the method, set the path variable to the preg replace function. The preg replace function allows us to replace portions of a string with another string. There are three arguments. Firstly, we must provide the pattern as a string. Inside the string, add the pattern we wrote from the previous lecture. Make sure it's surrounded by hash characters. The second argument is the replacement value. Our goal is to replace consecutive forward slash characters with a single forward slash character. Let's pass it in. Lastly, we must pass in the path. Before testing our work, let's verify our paths get normalized by registering more routes. Open the bootstrap file. I'm going to register the following paths with the get method. About slash team. Slash about slash team. Slash about slash team slash. If normalization works, these paths should have the same path after they've been normalized. Let's refresh the page. As you can see, the problem with the route for the home page has been fixed. We only have one slash. As for the other paths, they have been normalized too. Awesome! We've successfully normalized the paths. There are more edge cases to account for, but we'll leave it at that. Overall, I'm happy with the current implementation. If you want, you're more than welcome to improve the method. Before moving on, I'm going to remove the new routes from the bootstrap file. In the next lecture, let's begin working on supporting controllers. In this lecture, we're going to discuss a design pattern called MVC. The overall goal of our router is to render different content based on the path in the URL. The question is, should the router be responsible for rendering content? Not exactly. Instead, we should outsource the logic to a different file. Typically, routers rely on something called a controller to handle rendering content. Controllers are one component of a design pattern called MVC. The MVC pattern is one of the most widely adopted patterns in software development. It can be found across multiple programming languages and frameworks. So, what exactly is the MVC pattern? First things first, 
Let's get some terminology out of the way. In the programming world, we have a principle known as the separation of concerns. This principle is not specific to PHP. We can apply it to any programming language or framework. In fact, we can apply this principle to the real world. Hospitals can employ hundreds of people. There are surgeons, nurses, techs, chefs, janitors, etc. Each person is given a specialized job. Not a single employee performs all jobs. You can apply this concept to almost any industry. Businesses will always assign specific responsibilities to each employee. This principle can be applied to programming. We may have hundreds of classes. The separation of concerns principle states that we should split our logic by responsibility. This principle keeps our code base clean and organized. Let's move on to the next terminology. I've said the word design pattern. A design pattern is a solution to a common problem in object-oriented programming. As your project grows, your goal should be to write efficient code. During the development phase, you're going to encounter challenges with doing so. Design patterns can be thought of as guidelines for how you should write and structure code. You may be wondering, what are the differences between a design pattern and PSR? As we know, PSRs are standardized solutions. The main difference between PSR and a design pattern is that PSR is specific to PHP. Design patterns are applicable to most programming languages. In most cases, you're likely going to use design patterns and PSR in the same project. That brings us to the question, what problem does the MVC design pattern solve? The MVC design pattern is a solution for applying the separation of concerns principle. Let's say we were developing an application for a store. After a user purchases a product, they will be given a summary. Here's an example of what that solution could look like. We have three functions for checking that the user is logged in, updating their transaction after they've confirmed their purchase, and then grabbing the transaction. Next, the page would be generated with the data retrieved from the third function. Do you see the problem with this solution? We're mingling code for performing the logic with the code for rendering the page. By putting all our code into a single file, it can easily become unmanageable. Ideally, splitting our code into separate files results in the most manageable code possible. Here's an example. In one file, we have the logic for the page. In another file, we have the logic for rendering the HTML. Splitting our code into multiple files is standard practice. The MVC pattern is the solution to our problem. Let's take a moment to think about how we should split our logic. Typically, you can split your logic into three files. Firstly, we have our database logic. This portion of our program refers to code that interacts with the database. If we need to create, read, update, or delete data, these actions would be considered database logic. Next, we have logic for the HTML and CSS. Lastly, we have logic for the page. For example, you may need to perform actions such as sending an email or validating form data. Each of these portions of our application can be placed in individual files. I haven't used the technical terms for each portion, but here they are. The MVC pattern is an acronym for Model View Controller. The word model refers to the database logic. The word view refers to the HTML or template of a page. Lastly, the word controller refers to the logic for the page. Hopefully, this is starting to make sense. We're going to be using the MVC pattern in our project. Here's what the logic is going to look like. Everything starts with the router. Technically, the router is not part of the MVC pattern. However, the router is what will decide what controller to use. Websites can have dozens of pages. For each page, you will have a controller. The job of the router will be to select a specific controller. The job of the controller is to start loading the page. During this process, a page may need data. For example, let's say a visitor wants to view a list of products. Before we can display a page, we must grab the products from the database. Therefore, the controller works with the model to grab this information. The model's job is to interact with the database. It doesn't care what happens to the data or how a page gets rendered. All it does is grab the data and then return it. This data gets sent back to the controller. From there, the controller starts working with the view for displaying the content. During this process, the controller sends the data directly to the view since we're trying to display a list of products. 
You can think of the controller as the glue between the model and view. The model doesn't care how data is presented. It only cares about working with data. On the other hand, the view doesn't care where the data comes from, but does care about how data is presented. Our controller is responsible for selecting a model since we can have multiple models in a given project. The same goes for the views. We can have multiple templates for different pages. After all is said and done, the view gets sent to the client or browser. Typically, this is how the MVC pattern works. At the very least, this is how we're going to implement the MVC design pattern. That will be the focus of the next set of lectures. In the next lecture, let's get started by creating a controller. In this lecture, we're going to create our first controller. According to the MVC pattern, controllers are represented as classes. In addition, the controller logic must be outsourced into a separate file. Let's create a controller class for the home page since it's the only route in our application. Before we create a controller, let's create a directory for storing our controllers. Inside the source slash app directory, create a folder called controllers. The controllers directory is going to contain our controller files. Let's create a file inside this directory called homecontroller.php. The file name should be the page rendered by the controller with the word controller. It'll help other developers identify this file as a controller. At the top of the file, add the following namespace, app backslash controllers. As a reminder, developers like to use the names of the folders as the name for the namespace. Not required, but recommended. After adding the namespace, define a class called home controller. Inside this class, we must define a method that will be called by the router. Define a public function called home. Lastly, let's echo a message to indicate we're visiting the home page. Our controller is ready. Controllers are just classes responsible for rendering a page's content. The method name doesn't matter. In most cases, developers prefer to use a name describing the page. Alternative names could have been index or root. However, I think the name home suits our application. After creating the controller, it's time to register it with our router. In the next lecture, let's handle this process. In this lecture, we're going to register a controller with a route. We have our controller, but the class is never instantiated when our application is initialized. This process will be the job of the router. First, we must register the controller. In your editor, open the bootstrap file. First, let's update the get method to accept the controller. Pass in an array as the second argument to the method. Within this method, add the following value, app backslash controllers backslash home controller. In this example, we're passing in the class name, including the namespace. Initially, that might seem strange. Wouldn't it make sense to pass in an instance? For most applications, you're likely going to have dozens of routes. This means dozens of controllers. For each controller, you would have to create an instance. That's a waste of resources. If a user visits the home page, only the controller for the home page would be necessary. The other controllers would not be in use. Instances of a class take up memory. It's more efficient for a router to create an instance of a controller after it has found a match. For this reason, we're passing on the full name of the class with the namespace. So, you may be wondering, why are we wrapping this value with an array? The reason is simple. After an instance has been created, the next step is to run the method for displaying the page's contents. This array is going to contain the name of the class and method. In the array, pass in the home method. We're using strings, but PHP has a feature to allow us to create instances of classes based on the name and execute methods with method name. After passing in this value, let's update the get method to accept the controller. Open the application class. Scroll to the get method. In the parameter list, add an array parameter called controller. Next, pass this parameter onto the add method. Lastly, we must update the router to register the controller. 
add the controller parameter to the add method. Afterward, in the array, add a key called controller. The value will be the controller argument. Let's validate the controller registration by refreshing the page. As you can see, the class appears in the route record for the home page. Everything's going great. The next step is to instantiate this class when the route is visited. Let's continue working on the router in the next lecture. In this lecture, we're going to adjust the solution for the controller. In the bootstrap file, we're passing on the name of the class and method to execute when this route is visited. It's required to pass in the name of the class as a string. We don't want to pass on an instance, otherwise we would be wasting resources. This solution works, but it's prone to errors. We can potentially make a typo. For example, I may forget to add the letter S to the word controllers. Another example would be forgetting a forward slash character. Typos are one of the most common errors you can make as a developer. If possible, we should avoid using a plain string. Luckily, in version 8 of PHP, the class name can be accessed with a string. Let me show you this feature. First, let's import the home controller class from the app slash controllers namespace. Next, echo the following value, home controller class. Every class in PHP has a constant called class. Behind the scenes, PHP defines this constant for you. The value of this constant is the class name in a string. Let's check out the value in the browser. As you can see, the full class name gets displayed along with the namespace. Rather than typing the full path to the class ourselves, we can use this constant. Switch back to the editor. If we make a typo, our editors can inform us of our problem. For example, let's say I type class with a single s. After removing that character, a red squiggly line appears below the line of code. We can hover over the line to view the error. As you can see, our editor informs us that this constant doesn't exist. Previously, we didn't receive such an error from our editors. We wouldn't know there was a problem until we tried testing our app. Catching these errors ahead of time is a time saver. Let's update our solution to use this constant. Remove the echo statement. Let's replace the first item in the array of the get method with the home controller class constant. Unfortunately, there isn't a constant available for grabbing the names of our methods. For now, we must manually create the string ourselves. After passing in those values, refresh the page. After refreshing the page, the string for the class name is the same as before. By making a simple change, we can avoid the likelihood of making a typo. In the next lecture, let's begin updating the router to detect the route. In this lecture, we're going to dispatch a route. The word dispatch means to send something off to a destination. I think it makes sense. The job of our router is to display the page content for a specific URL. In a way, we're sending content from the server to the browser. Hence, we're dispatching the page content. That's one way of thinking of it. In your editor, open the router file. Let's define a method to initiate the process of dispatching content. At the bottom of the class, define a method called dispatch. This method is going to need two pieces of information, which are the path and method. Add these parameters with the string type. Technically, our method is capable of grabbing these values without them being passed into the method. However, our router shouldn't make assumptions. It's not uncommon for developers to override the path and method before dispatching a route. By accepting these values, they will have an opportunity to do so. As an extra precaution, let's format these values. For the path variable, pass the variable into the normalize path method. Since the route's path is normalized, the path passed into the method should be normalized too. Otherwise, we may get inconsistent results when dispatching the route. Next, let's set the method parameter to the stringToUpper method function. If we scroll to the add method, we're formatting the method of the route before inserting it into the array. 
Therefore, we should do the same to the method passed into the dispatch method. It's important to apply consistent formatting to our values. Back in the dispatch method, let's echo the path and method parameters. Next, let's call this method from the application class. The router should be dispatched when the application is started. We defined a method for this exact moment called run. Let's replace the echo with code for dispatching the router. Before dispatching the router, we should grab the path and method. After all, our router is going to need this information. First, let's grab the path. Define a variable called path. The value will be the server request URI variable. As we know, the server super global variable contains information on the request. We can grab the URL via the request URI key. However, we're not interested in the entire URL. We only want the path. Therefore, let's wrap this value with a function called parseURL. The parseURL function is defined by PHP. It allows us to extract specific pieces of information from the URL. There are two arguments. Firstly, we must pass in the URL, which we are already doing. Secondly, we must specify the type of information to extract. If you hover your mouse over the method, we can view a complete list of values that can be grabbed with the help of constants. The constant we're interested in is called PHP URL path. Let's pass this constant as the second argument to the function. The return value of this function will be the path in the URL. Let's start working on the method. Define a variable called method. The value will be the server request method variable. Lastly, let's call the this router dispatch method with these variables. One more step. Open the bootstrap file. In this file, we're dumping the contents of the application variable. It's no longer necessary to do this. It's safe to remove this line of code. After doing so, switch over to the browser to view the results. On the page, we're able to view the current path and method of the request. Our router has all the information it needs to render a page. Just to make sure, let's update the path in our URL to something random. Regardless of what page we're viewing, the router can grab the path and method. Awesome! In the next lecture, let's continue working on the dispatch method to render the page. In this lecture, we're going to search for a route with the help of regular expressions. Let's continue working inside the dispatch method of the router class. The first step is to loop through the routes. On each iteration, we'll check the path and method from each route and compare them against the path and method passed into the method. If we find a match, we can proceed to render a page. Let's replace the echo statement with a for each loop. The expression will be the following. This routes as route. Next, we're going to add a conditional statement. The condition will be a function called preg match. Before rendering a page, we should verify the route matches the current URL. We can compare two strings with the preg match function. This function uses a regular expression to search for matches. If a match is found, we've got the correct route. There are two arguments. Firstly, we must provide a regular expression as a string. Let's add the following. Hash route path hash. As a reminder, the hash characters act as delimiters. They tell PHP where the regular expression begins and ends. We're interested in performing an exact match. The path must match exactly with the pattern. If we pass in a plain value, the pattern is an exact match. However, this pattern allows for the path to appear anywhere in the full URL. That's not what we want. At the beginning of the expression, add the caret character. This character forces the expression to check if the value begins with the pattern. At the end of the expression, add the dollar sign character. This character is similar to the caret character, except it checks if the value ends with the pattern. Essentially, we're forcing an exact match. Next, 
let's pass in the path variable. If a match is found, the function returns 1, which evaluates to true. However, we're not interested in an exact match. Instead, we're going to check if there isn't a match. At the beginning of the function, add the NOT operator. If there isn't a match, we can add the continue keyword. In my opinion, it's easier to read code when it's not deeply nested. The continue keyword allows us to move on to the next item in the array. Some of you may be wondering, why aren't we using a comparison operator? Truthfully, this operator is just as effective in our situation. However, I'm accounting for future scenarios. In the future, we're going to add more features to our router by adding parameters. By introducing route parameters, comparison operators will not be helpful to us. So, to save time, I've decided to use regular expressions now instead of later. We're not finished with the conditional statement. After the preg match function, add the following. Or route method does not strictly equal method. In addition to checking if the paths don't match, we'll also check if the methods don't match. It's possible for paths to match, but to have different methods. If that's the case, we shouldn't instantiate the controller for the current record. It's better to move on to the next route. If both conditions don't end up passing, this means we found a route. After the conditional statement, let's echo a message to indicate a match was found. We're finished. Let's verify our work by refreshing the page. If we visit the root path of our site, the router has found a match. Perfect! Let's make sure the matches are working by visiting a random path. In the address bar, visit any path aside from the home page. This time, the router couldn't find a match. Our router is functioning as expected. Now that we've found a match, we can instantiate the controller associated with the route. In the next lecture, let's begin this process. In this lecture, we're going to instantiate a controller from the route. As always, we're working inside the router class. At the moment, we're echoing a message to indicate we've found a route. Let's replace this echo statement with the name of the class and method. Type the following, class function equals route controller. For readability, we're grabbing the class and method name from the route. Their values are extracted into variables called class and function. As a reminder, the controller item is an array storing the class name and method name. We can extract these values into variables by destructuring them with the square bracket syntax. The first item in the array is always a class name, whereas the second item is always the method name. This step is optional, but helpful for readability. It provides clarity as to the type of values we're working with inside our loop. The next step is to create an instance of the class. Keep in mind, the controller item contains the class name, not the instance. We must instantiate the class with the name. Define a variable called controller instance. The value will be the following, new class. It is completely acceptable to provide a string after the new keyword. As long as the string points to a specific class with the namespace, PHP is capable of creating an instance. The next step is to invoke the method passed into the route. Type the following, controller instance function. Initially, this might seem strange. However, it's acceptable to type a string after the arrow operator. PHP attempts to resolve the value in the string to a method in the class. If it finds a method, it'll allow us to invoke the method like any other method. Sometimes, developers like to wrap the variable with a pair of curly brackets. In our case, it doesn't matter. The code works with or without the curly brackets. Let's try testing our work. In the browser, refresh the page. Ta-da! Our router works! The message from the home controller appears on the page. After a few lectures, we've successfully rendered content based on a path. Overall, the router we've developed is simple. There are additional tweaks we can make, but I'm satisfied with the current state of the router. At this point, I hope you can see the benefit of the MVC pattern. 
Using the MVC pattern keeps our code base clean. If we ever want to update the code for the home page, we won't have to worry about breaking code in other locations. Everything related to the home page is isolated to a single class, keeping our code base clean and maintainable. In the next lecture, let's cover one more topic. In this lecture, we're going to configure our editors for PHP. Code formatting should always be consistent, but what formatting practices do we follow? It turns out that PSR has a set of recommended formatting rules. In the resource section of this lecture, I provide a link to PSR 12. PSR 12 is the most popular standard. A majority of projects follow the formatting practices outlined in this document. I highly recommend reading through this document for a better understanding. There's one point worth highlighting. Let's read the first sentence of the overview section together. This specification extends, expands, and replaces PSR 2, the coding style guide, and requires adherence to PSR 1, the basic coding standard. As noted by the documentation, if you're going to use PSR 12, you must also follow the formatting rules in PSR 1. Be sure to read the documentation for this standard too. With that being said, it's possible for you to forget to format your code. Luckily, most editors support auto-formatting. Let's try enabling this feature with Visual Studio Code. Switch over to your editors. Under the File menu, navigate to Preferences Settings. Visual Studio Code offers hundreds of settings. There are two tabs available called User and Workspace. You will find the same settings under both tabs. The difference is where the settings are applied. If we modify the settings under the User tab, these changes are applied to all projects. The Workspace tab applies settings to the current project. So, if you ever modify these settings, be sure to select the correct tab. Otherwise, your changes can potentially affect other projects. In our case, we're not going to use either tab. These settings apply to all files. However, we don't want to format other types of files. We're only interested in applying formatting to PHP files. Luckily, we can apply settings to specific files by applying a filter. In the search bar, type the following, at language colon PHP. The language filter allows us to apply settings to a specific programming language. In this case, we're going to filter the settings to PHP. Let's search for a setting called Format on Save. As the name implies, this setting forces the editor to format our code when a file is saved. Let's enable this setting. Next, let's search for a setting called Default Formatter. In the previous section, we installed the IntelliFence extension. This extension has a formatter that follows the PSR 12 standard. When Visual Studio Code formats our file on saves, it'll use the formatter from this setting. Let's set the formatter to PHP IntelliFence. There's one more setting we'll apply. In the search bar, completely replace the search term with the following, IntelliFence Format Braces. This setting should be set to PSR 12. According to the PSR 12 standard, curly braces should be placed on new lines. After making those changes, we're ready to start coding. Just in case, you can verify the settings have been applied by clicking on the button at the top right corner. If you hover your mouse over this button, it says Open Settings JSON. Clicking on this setting opens a JSON file. Behind the scenes, Visual Studio Code's configuration is written with JSON. As you can see, I have dozens of settings. You do not need to have the same settings as me. Some of these settings are for other programming languages as I use Visual Studio Code as my primary code editor. Scrolling through this file, there should be a property called PHP wrapped with square brackets. Your value should be similar to mine. Let's try testing our code. Open the home controller file. I'm going to move the curly bracket for the class definition to the same line as the class name. Next, I'll save the file. As I do so, the bracket moves to a new line. Visual Studio Code is formatting our code before saving it. If you get the same behavior, congrats! 
you've successfully enabled formatting. The IntelliFence extension tries its best to adhere to the PSR 12 standard. However, it can't format everything. It's up to you to verify that your code is following the guidelines outlined in the document. That concludes this section. The entire section was dedicated to designing a basic router. Thanks to our efforts, we're able to override Apache's file-based routing behavior. We're able to render custom content based on the path. In the next section, let's start working on a template engine to help us render pages. In this lecture, we're going to continue working on our MVC framework by adding the view. So far, we've only implemented the control portion of the MVC framework. Our controllers are echoing plain text to the browser. In practical scenarios, HTML should be sent with the response. In order to do so, we're going to use a template engine. Out of the box, PHP has basic templating engine features such as looping, conditional rendering, and includes. We won't have to do much to implement a template engine in our framework. We're just going to add a few additional features to make it easier to work with templates. Before we do, why would we want to use a template engine? First things first, let's define what a template engine is. A template engine is a package for generating dynamic HTML. Template engines typically have features to help us loop through data, conditionally render templates, and import data into a template. Once again, PHP is already a templating language itself. There are a few benefits to using a template engine. Firstly, template engines are easier for front-end developers. PHP is considered to be a server-side programming language. If you're writing PHP, you're considered a back-end developer. Front-end developers mainly focus on HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. Their PHP knowledge may be limited. Template engines are designed to be easier to maintain and write. If you're working on a team, you may want to introduce a template engine to boost productivity. It'll be easier for front-end developers to focus on basic logic instead of the logic in a controller. Secondly, template engines have a layer of security. One of the biggest issues with PHP is global variables. We shouldn't allow our templates to access every variable in our script. One of the advantages of a template is isolating data from a template. Therefore, the likelihood of our application breaking because a team member updated a variable gets reduced. There are various template engines available within the PHP community. We don't have to create our own. The most popular solutions are Twig by Symfony and Blade by Laravel. You can't go wrong with either option. For this course, we're going to be creating a basic template engine. There isn't a reason to reach for a package from the community. Our application doesn't need the complexities of a modern template engine. This section is going to focus on developing a template engine. You'll be surprised by how easy it is. When you're ready, I'll see you in the next lecture. In this lecture, we're going to begin preparing and initializing the template engine. Like the other tools in our framework, the template engine will be a class. Inside the framework directory, create a new file called templateengine.php. Add support for strict typing. Next, set the namespace to framework. Lastly, define a class called template engine. Next, let's create an instance of this class from our controller. Open the home controller. The home controller is responsible for rendering the content of the home page. Therefore, it makes sense for an instance of our template engine to be available to our controller. Otherwise, our controller wouldn't know how to render an HTML document. There are better locations to instantiate the engine, such as in a container. However, our framework doesn't have a container. For now, we're going to create an instance from this class. At the top of the file, import the framework backslash template engine class. Typically, we would use the name of the class as the property name. However, the name is slightly too long for my liking. For readability, I'm going to stick with the name view for storing instances of this class. The next step is to instantiate the class. We're going to do so from the construct method. Add this method to the controller. Inside the method, set the view property to a new instance of the template engine class. 
Let's verify the instance was created by dumping the property inside the home method. Afterward, refresh the browser. Just like that, we've created a basic template engine. It doesn't do anything impressive. In the next lecture, let's continue working on our template engine. In this lecture, we're going to create a directory dedicated to our templates. Our templates are not going to be written directly inside our controller. Instead, we should centralize them into a single directory. At the moment, our template engine doesn't know where to find templates. The location of our templates will need to be stored before we can render them. First things first, let's create the directory. Inside the Applications folder, create a folder called Views. The folder name is in all lowercase letters. Unlike the other directories, this directory is not going to contain classes. Therefore, it's perfectly fine to use a different naming convention. Next, let's create a template for the home page. Inside this folder, create a file called index.php. Let's insert a pair of H1 tags with a simple message to identify our template. After creating a basic template in our views directory, let's store the location in the template engine class. Open this class with your editor. Every project is going to be different. Not all projects are going to have a views directory. Some projects may use different directory names, such as templates or resources. Our template engine shouldn't assume the location for templates. It's up to the application to configure the location. Let's define a property for storing this information. Define the construct method. Not only are we going to need to store this information, we must provide a way to configure the property. Let's store the value as the class is being instantiated. Inside the parameter list, add a private string property called basePath. The basePath property will store the absolute path to the directory with our templates. After creating this property, let's update the home controller. Our editor informs us of an error with the template engine instance. Since the class was updated to accept a path, we must provide a path. For this step, we're going to store the path in a constant. This step is optional. Technically, we can hard code the path into the function's argument. However, you're likely to reference paths in various locations of your app. It can be useful to have a single file containing all your paths. By doing so, you can easily update your paths from one location instead of searching for them in various locations. Inside the app folder, create a folder called config. PHP configuration files for our application are going to exist in this directory. Next, create a file called paths.php. Declare support for strict typing. Afterward, add a namespace called app backslash config. Define a class called paths. We're going to define our paths as constants. We don't have to use a class to define constants. By using a class, our constants can be auto-loaded with Composer. I think it's easier that way. Inside this class, define a public constant called view. Set the constant to the following value, directory dot slash dot dot slash views. We're pointing the path to the views directory. Let's use this constant. Switch back to the home controller file. Before using our constant, we must import our class, which is app backslash config backslash paths. Next. Pass in the paths views constant into the template engine class. After making those changes, let's verify the path was saved by refreshing the page. As you can see, the template engine has stored the location of our templates. With this information, it'll be able to grab any template from our project. In the next lecture, let's define a method for rendering a template. In this lecture, we're going to start rendering a template from our controller. The responsibility of the template engine class is to provide a basic method for rendering the template. 
it'll handle most of the logic for this process. So, let's define the method. In your editor, open the template engine class. At the bottom of the class, define a public method called render. Applications can have dozens of templates. Similar to the base path, we shouldn't assume which template should be rendered. Let's accept this information as an argument to the method. Inside the parameter list, add a string parameter called template. If you were to explore the PHP template engine ecosystem, there are different approaches to loading templates. Some engines go as far to create a custom language for templates. Our engine is going to be extremely simple. All we're going to do is include the template with the include keyword. The path to the file will be the following. This base path slash template. All we're doing is combining the base path with the template. Our method is ready. Let's call it from the controller. Open the home controller class. Replace the dump function with the this view render method. The name of our template was called index.php. Let's try viewing the browser. On the page, we're able to view the contents of the template. At first glance, this seems like a lot of work to render a template. Wouldn't it have been easier to render the template from the home controller? Technically, we could have, but that would have presented some issues. To understand those issues, let's head back to our editors. In the controller, let's define a variable called secret. The value for this variable can be anything you want. Next, let's switch over to the index.php template. In this template, let's try echoing this variable. Lastly, head back to the browser. As you can see, we're receiving an error. Our engine is unable to grab the secret variable. Functions do not have access to variables defined outside of their scope. If we were to add the include statement from the controller, our template would have access to variables it shouldn't have access to in the first place. Our template is completely isolated. This behavior prevents developers working on our templates from breaking a controller or data in another class. That's great, but it does present another problem. What if we want to pass on data from our controller to our templates? In the next lecture, we're going to address this issue. In this lecture, we're going to add support for template variables. As we discussed before, our template doesn't have access to any data. This behavior is beneficial. It prevents our templates from accidentally updating data or displaying sensitive information to the user. On the other hand, your templates may need data to render content. Luckily, it's completely possible to add this feature to our templates. In your editor, open the template engine class. We're going to modify the render method. In the parameter list, add an array parameter called data. Controllers will be able to send any type of data to our templates. Therefore, I think capturing this data inside an array is appropriate. In some cases, a template may not have any data. In that case, we'll make this parameter optional by assigning a default value of an empty array. By accepting an array, the array becomes available to our template. Let's try testing this feature. First, open the home controller. Let's remove the secret variable. It's not necessary anymore. Instead, let's pass an array into the render method. For this example, let's pass on the title of the page. Add a key called title with the following value, home page. Next, open the index template. Inside the h1 tags, let's echo the data title variable. The array passed into the render method is stored in the data variable. Since the variable is a parameter of the render method, the included file has access to the function's parameters. Let's refresh the page in the browser. As you can see, the page has access to the data from the array. This solution works, but we can take it further by tidying the template. Switch back to the template engine class. 
at the moment, we must access the values from their respective keys in the data variable. That's fine, but readability can be improved by extracting each value into individual variables. That's possible with a function called extract. Let me show you how it works. Before including the file, let's call the extract function. This function accepts an array. Let's pass in the data array. This function takes every key in our array and creates a variable for them with their respective values. The name of the variables are based on the key names. With that said, it's important for the array to be an associative array. Values without names are ignored by the function. By using this function, we won't have to perform a loop to create the same effect. There's another argument, which is optional. What if a variable already exists from the array? If there are conflicting variable names, we have the option of skipping the item in the array. We can enable this behavior by passing in a constant called extract skip. Alternatively, you can use the extract overwrite constant to allow the function to override existing variables. To be on the safe side, we'll skip duplicate variables. Let's switch over to our template. In the template, let's echo the title key as a standalone variable. Next, refresh the page. As you can see, our template continues to work. Extracting is optional, but makes our templates more readable. I prefer it over accessing values by array keys. In this lecture, we're going to enable output buffering in our application. Let's take a look at the template engine class. In this class, we're immediately including the template. This causes the template to render on the browser. That may be fine for some situations, but it's not recommended. Sometimes, developers may want to manipulate the template further after retrieving it. Alternatively, we may want to perform additional actions after grabbing the template. We can achieve this behavior by using output buffers. Output buffers are an interesting feature of PHP. By default, PHP sends content directly to the browser as it processes your PHP code. It does not send the entire document all at once. If we wrote an echo statement, the message would appear in the browser. However, if we have more code, the message may appear before the rest of the code has been processed. I like to use the analogy of viewing a large image on the browser. Typically, browsers don't wait for the entire image to be downloaded. Large images are displayed as they're being downloaded. As you can see from this example, the image is slowly coming in. It's the same for PHP. This behavior may not always be desirable. In some cases, you may want to wait for every line of PHP code to be executed. After PHP is finished running, you can send the content all at once. That's possible with a feature called output buffering. An output buffer instructs PHP not to send the document in bits and pieces. Instead, the content will be stored in memory. After PHP is finished running, the content will be sent to the browser. However, we have the option of closing the output buffer. The content stored in memory can be stored in a variable as a string. As a result, we can return the string from the function. Before we can use output buffers, let's verify this feature is enabled. PHP is a modular language. This sets it apart from a language like JavaScript. We can enable or disable features from the language. Output buffering is a feature that can be disabled. A majority of host providers enable this feature. Output buffering is considered part of the core language. However, you may encounter a hosting provider disabling this feature. If so, you should message them to enable this feature. Alternatively, you may be able to enable this feature yourself. There are different solutions for enabling this feature. However, the best solution is to modify PHP's configuration files. Unfortunately, Modifying configuration files is not always guaranteed to work. Ultimately, host providers have the power to disable a feature altogether. Regardless, let's learn how to enable or disable output buffering. One day, you may need this information. In XAMPP, open the php.ini file. Pause the video if you need to open this file. After you've found the file, search for a setting called Output Buffering. If this setting can't be found, 
you may add it in manually. XAMPP should have this setting available within this file. As you can see, the setting has been enabled. There are three possible values for this setting. The option can be set to ON. As you type this word, the word must be capitalized. Do not use lowercase letters. By setting this option to ON, output buffering will be enabled. To turn a setting off, this option can be set to OFF. Once again, the word must be capitalized. The last type of value can be a number. As a reminder, buffers are a storage mechanism for output. By default, templates will be able to store limitless amounts of data. This behavior can hog resources on a server. You can limit the storage taken by a buffer by setting a size in bytes. Most developers recommend setting this option to 4096. Overall, enabling options is simple. If this doesn't work, chances are your host provider has permanently disabled output buffering. Typically, this shouldn't be the case. Output buffering doesn't cause many problems. I highly recommend searching for hosts offering output buffering. We are going to leave this value to its default state. In the next lecture, let's try using output buffering in our script. In this lecture, we're going to update our template engine to use output buffers. Open the template engine class. The first step is to create a new buffer. Buffers should be created before the template gets included. Above the include statement, run a function called obstart. This function is defined by the PHP language. It will tell PHP to store content in an output buffer. We are preventing PHP from sending content to the browser until every line has finished running or the buffer is closed. Before closing the buffer, we must retrieve the content. Otherwise, PHP may output the content early. We should avoid that scenario since we want to continue running PHP code. After the include statement, create a variable called output. The value for this variable will be the obGetContents function. This function searches for an active output buffer. If it finds one, the content from the buffer will be returned from the function as a string. You can probably guess what that means. We can return this variable from our function. Let's return the output variable from the function. There's one more thing. After the output variable, let's run a function called obEndClean. The obEndClean function performs two actions. First, it'll stop output buffering from running. PHP will revert to its original behavior. Secondly, the output buffer will have its memory wiped. Content stored in the output buffer will be lost. We should always end the buffer. Otherwise, our server would be wasting resources allocating memory for content already retrieved. Clearing the buffer is beneficial to us. We should always be conscious of how much resources we are consuming. Since the render method returns the content, it's the controller's job to output the content. As a reminder, the purpose of using output buffering was to allow outside sources to manipulate the content before rendering it on the page. Let's switch over to the home controller. For the home page, we're going to echo the return value of the render method. Next, let's refresh the page. Great, we've got the same behavior as before. By using output buffering, our controllers have more power over the content rendered. For the home page, it doesn't make much of a difference, but it can be useful for other pages in our application. In the next lecture, let's start creating a proper home page for our application. In this lecture, it's time to start adding the design of our application to our project. Thus far, we've been rendering plain text or regular HTML elements. The design of our site is not exciting. This course primarily focuses on PHP. It's not an HTML or CSS course. I fully expect you to know these languages. For those of you not feeling confident, don't worry. In the resource section of this course, I provide a link to a small course on HTML and CSS. This course has everything you'd like to learn about these languages. I'm not going to be using advanced features. Most of the HTML and CSS are going to be simple. Like I said before, the goal of this course is to learn PHP. Once you feel confident, let's start loading the HTML and CSS. In the resource section of this lecture, 
I provide a link to a gist with the static code for our site. There are two files, which are called index.html and main.css. We won't be reviewing these files as they're fairly basic. Nothing inside them contains PHP code. Let's transfer the content from the index.html file to the index.php template. Copy the HTML to your clipboard. Next, open the index.php file. Replace the existing content with our template. Let's work on the CSS. So far, we've been focused on rendering HTML content. We haven't talked about other types of content, such as style sheets or images. Luckily, rendering other types of content is easy. The logic we've written for the router only applies to PHP files. If the client attempts to access a static file, such as a CSS file, Apache can handle sending it to the client. File-based routing is still enabled for non-PHP files. Therefore, in our public directory, we can add our CSS files. Inside the public folder, create another folder called Assets. Afterward, create a file called main.css. Back in the browser, grab the CSS code. Paste it inside the CSS file. It's important to create our static assets inside the public directory. Otherwise, they won't be accessible via an HTTP URL. Let's switch over to the browser. Inside the address bar, navigate to the assets slash main.css file. As you can see, our file gets served from the browser. If you're able to successfully view the contents of the CSS file, you're good to go. Let's try viewing the home page. Here's the interface for our application. Overall, it's very simple. We have links for creating an account or logging into the application. On the home page, users are able to view a list of their transactions. Let's keep improving our templates by adding support for partials. In this lecture, we're going to split our template into sections called partials. Sometimes, we may want to outsource sections of a page into a separate template file. Templates can be further broken into partials. A partial is a section of a page for displaying a portion or section of a page. Some examples would be headers, footers, and sidebars. On our site, we have a header and footer. If we had multiple pages, we would have to update each page to have consistent appearances. Rather than modifying multiple templates to modify the header, Let's outsource this part of the template into a separate file. Switch over to your editor. Inside the Views folder, create a folder called Partials. It's not required but recommended to create a directory dedicated to templates for storing sections of a page. You don't have to call it Partials. Some developers refer to it as Includes. It's all preference. Next, inside this folder, Create a file called underscore header.php. It's common practice to add an underscore character to the file name to help other developers identify a partial. Once again, you don't have to follow this naming convention. For this course, I'll be following this convention. Next, let's head over to the index.php file. Inside this file, cut everything from the beginning of the file to a comment that says end header. For your convenience, I've provided HTML comments to help you find specific sections in our template. Be sure to keep an eye out for them. Paste the HTML code into the underscore header.php file. The next step is to load this partial. Back in the index file, add the include statement at the top of the file. Whenever possible, I prefer to use absolute paths in our templates. Let's define a method in our engine to generate an absolute path to our views directory. Open the template engine file. At the bottom of the class, define a method called resolve. This method will accept a string parameter called path. 
Next, return the following. This base path slash path. It's a similar value we had in the render method. Actually, we can use our method from within the render method to avoid redundancy. Let's replace this portion of the code with a call to the thisResolve method. Pass in the template parameter. Let's try using this method from our template. While we don't have access to external variables, we do have access to the methods in the template engine class. This includes the resolve method. After the include statement, let's call the resolve method with the following path, partials slash underscore header dot php. Before we test our work, let's try separating the footer into a template. Inside the partials folder, create a file called underscore footer dot php. Back in the index file, search for a comment that says footer. Cut and paste everything from this comment to the bottom of the template into the footer template. Lastly, head back to the index file. In the same location where we cut the footer, include the footer file. Alright, let's refresh this page. As usual, the page is completely functional. By separating the sections into files, we can focus on specific sections without affecting other areas. We're getting close to finishing our template engine. In the next lecture, let's add one more feature before moving on to the next section. In this lecture, I have an exercise for you. During the development phase of your application, you'll want a page to experiment with features. You can think of it as a playground. Let's create an about page. It sounds like the perfect place to experiment with features. Before we do so, the About page should have a controller. As an exercise, try creating an About page. During this process, you must register a route, create a controller, and render a template. In the Resource section of this lecture, I provide a link to the HTML for the About page. Upon creating the About template file, the HTML from this gist should be pasted as the content. You have all the information you need. Pause the video and give the exercise a try. Good luck! Welcome back. Hopefully, you were able to create the page. If not, that's perfectly fine. Let's go through the exercise together. The first step is to create the controller. Inside the app slash controllers directory, create a file called aboutcontroller.php. Add support for strict typing. Next, add the app backslash controllers namespace. Afterward, import the framework backslash template engine class. Import the app backslash config backslash paths class. We can proceed to define the about controller class. Since we're trying to render a template, an instance of the template engine class must exist. Define a property called view with the template engine class as the type. Let's instantiate this class and assign it to the property. Add the construct method. Inside the method, set the view property to a new instance of the template engine class. Our class is almost finished. The next step is to define a method responsible for rendering the page. Define a public method called about. Inside this method, return the thisViewRender method. Two pieces of information are required. First, pass in the template name, which will be called about.php. Next, let's provide an array of data. In this array, we'll set the title key to about. This template doesn't exist in our application. Let's take the time to create it. Inside the views directory, create the about.php file. This is the part where we can paste in the HTML from the gist. There's nothing special worth mentioning about the HTML file. It's all plain HTML and CSS. The content is going to be missing the header and footer. 
we can reuse the partials we created from the previous lecture. At the top of the file, include the partials slash underscore header dot php file with the this resolve method. Do the same for the partials slash underscore footer dot php file at the bottom of the file. The last step is to register a route. Open the bootstrap file. At the top of the file, we must import our controller. Import the about controller from the app backslash controllers namespace. Lastly, let's call the get method on the application instance. The path for this page will be slash about. For the second argument, pass in an array. Inside this array, pass in the about controller class constant and about method name. Our route is ready. After making those changes, let's head over to the browser. Navigate to the about page. If everything works, you should see something similar to what I see. It's the about page. Pretty cool, right? Our framework makes it easy to add new routes and render content. In the next lecture, let's explore that final feature I mentioned in the previous lecture. In this lecture, we're going to implement one more feature to our template before moving on to the next section. Security is absolutely crucial for any application. One of the biggest issues with templating engines is rendering data. We're able to inject data into our templates. However, what if the data is untrusted? It's possible for malicious data to slip through the cracks. When this scenario happens, this data gets exposed to your users. You should always take every step to prevent this problem from happening. The most common technique for displaying data is to escape it before being rendered. Escaping is the process of converting a character into a different character without losing its original appearance. The purpose of escaping is to prevent a compiler or interpreter from accidentally processing the character as an instruction. If it does process it as an instruction, we may get unintended behavior. In the resource section of this lecture, I provide a link to a tutorial on HTML entities. This course assumes you know HTML, but there's a chance you may not have learned about entities. As we know, HTML tags are written with angle brackets. Sometimes, you may want to use angle brackets without the browser interpreting them as HTML tags. In these cases, you can use HTML entities, which are a sequence of characters for representing a single character without them being processed as an instruction. If you scroll through the page, you'll come across a table. Instead of writing the less than character, we can use the entity name. When the browser encounters this sequence of characters, the characters won't be displayed as is. Instead, they're converted into the less than character. You can click on the Try Me button to see an example. As you can see, the preview displays the less than character, not the sequence of characters. So, why is this important? What if our data contains angle brackets? If we attempt to display data as is, it's possible for a browser to interpret angle brackets as an HTML tag, thus breaking our page. If we allow users to inject HTML into our pages, we leave ourselves vulnerable to an attack known as XSS. It's short for cross-site scripting. It's when malicious code is inserted into our page. Hackers can insert scripts to steal users' login information or force them to perform actions without their permission. Ideally, Specific characters should be converted into HTML entities before displaying them. It adds a layer of security, as data may contain malicious HTML. Let's look at an example. In your editor, open the About controller. Inside the array of the Render method, add an item called Dangerous Data. The value will be the following, script alert 123 script. The code we've written is JavaScript. I'm not going to go over the syntax of JavaScript. It's not important. What's important is the result of this code. Let's try displaying this data in our template. Switch over to the About template. 
scroll to the Escaping Data HTML comment. Inside the paragraph element, let's echo the dangerous data variable. Next, refresh the page. The code from the script tag gets processed as HTML. A pop-up should appear with the numbers 1, 2, 3. That's not ideal. The code we've written isn't completely harmful, but you can imagine what a hacker would do to us. It's completely possible to force a redirect or steal the user's cookies. We shouldn't allow data to be added to our template in an insecure manner. To avoid these situations, we should escape our data. Luckily, PHP offers a function called HTML Special Characters. In the resource section of this lecture, I provide a link to this function. This function is defined by PHP. If you look through the documentation, it'll tell you what characters are converted by using this function. As you can see, it targets characters for HTML tags. Let's try using this function. In your editor, open the functions file. In my opinion, the name of the function is too long. Let's create a sugar function for a shorter name. Inside this file, define a function called e. The name is short for escape. Let's add a parameter called value. Type hint this parameter with the mixed type. We're not always going to receive strings. Sometimes we may need to pass in numbers, which is why we're allowing for mixed types. Next, let's set the return type to string. Lastly, from within the function, return the HTML special characters function with the value variable. We may get an error when calling this function. If we pass in a number, our program may throw an error because the HTML special characters function requires a string. Let's typecast the value into a string. This function definition is completely optional. Typically, templates may need to output dozens of variables. To boost productivity, defining a sugar function can save us a few keystrokes. Let's try using our function. Back in the about template, wrap the dangerous data variable with the e function. Next, refresh the page. As you can see, the JavaScript code injected into the template has been escaped. The pop-up no longer appears. Taking the time to escape data is crucial. Otherwise, you leave your users susceptible to hackers. I have an exercise for you. On both pages of our application, we're providing a variable called title. The purpose of this variable is to display it in the tab of the page. Open the underscore header.php file. Inside this file, I want you to output the title variable in the appropriate location. During this process, make sure to escape it. Pause the video and give it a try. Good luck! Welcome back. Hopefully, you were able to output the title. If not, let's quickly walk through the solution. Scroll to the title tag. At the moment, the title outputs phpiggy. Before this text, write the following. Echo e title dash. Like before, we're escaping the data with the e function. Let's try testing our work. Refresh the page. As you can see, the title is dynamically added to the page. You can navigate to the home page to verify the behavior. Perfect! In the next lecture, let's wrap up our discussion by refactoring our code base. It's starting to feel cluttered. In this lecture, we're going to refactor our code base. If we look at the bootstrap file, the file has two routes. It's not a big deal, but it can become a problem in the future. As our project grows, more routes will be registered in our app. As a result, our files can quickly become cluttered. I think it would be a good idea to outsource the logic for registering routes in a separate file. We already know how to perform this type of optimization. We can use a static class to contain this logic. However, I want to show you an alternative solution, which is to use a function. Typically, I would use a static class, but you may come across functions for performing this type of action. Either solution is valid. I just want to show you a different way of doing things. First, inside the app slash configuration folder, create a file called routes.php. 
declare support for strict typing. Next, set the namespace to app backslash config. Afterward, define a function called register routes. The goal of this function will be to register routes for our application. Let's move the code for registering routes into this function. Back in the bootstrap file, cut every line of code where we registered routes. Next, paste it into the function. Afterward, we're going to receive errors because the controller classes are not imported into this file. Let's quickly grab those import statements and place them into our file. During this process, be sure to remove the import statements from the bootstrap file. Use your editor to help you decide which import statements can remain, as they'll have a faded color than the other import statements. Another error is going to be present. The route registration code requires the app instance, which is no longer available. When we call this function, we should provide the instance as an argument. At the top of the file, import the framework backslash app class. Next, add an argument called app, annotated with the app class. Our function is ready. The next step is to import it into the bootstrap file. Functions can be auto-loaded into files similar to classes. However, there isn't a standard available for functions. Developers must manually auto-load files with functions. First, let's learn how to import a function. In the bootstrap file, type the following. Use function app backslash config backslash register route. Functions can be imported with the use function keyword. We can start using this function. Back to where we cut the routes. Let's replace the original code with this function. As we call this function, be sure to pass in the application instance. Otherwise, we won't be able to properly register routes. There's one more step before we can consider this solution complete. Composer does not support autoloading for functions. This feature is only available for classes. We must manually tell Composer to load this file. Open the composer.json file. Inside the autoload object, add an array called files. We can instruct Composer to autoload files by listing them inside this array. This array can contain a list of file paths. Let's pass in the source slash app slash config slash routes.php file. We're not done yet. Manually autoloading files requires us to dump the previously generated autoloaded files. Switch over to the command line. Run the composer dump dash autoload command. After making those changes, we can try testing our work by refreshing the home page. If the app continues to work normally, you successfully outsourced the routes to a separate file. I know that took a bit of work, but it's well worth it to keep our code base organized. Once again, you don't need to autoload functions. We could have used static classes. I wanted to show you how to autoload functions since some developers prefer them over static classes. Functions are considered simpler to read. We're finished with our template engine. There are more improvements we can make, but we'll leave it in its current state. If we need to make adjustments, we'll do so as we progress through the course. In the next section, let's talk about containers. In this lecture, we're going to talk about a few concepts. It's going to be a bit heavy, but I'll try my best to talk about each concept and why they're important to our project. As always, let's talk about the problems with our application. Once we understand the problem, the solution will become easier to understand. At the moment, I'm viewing the Home Controller class. Inside this class, we're instantiating the Template Engine class. This solution works, but it's not ideal. The Home Controller class is not the only class that's going to render a page. Our application may have dozens of pages, which means multiple controllers. So, let's take a look at our problem from a bird's eye view. Our problem is that the class for rendering HTML should be available to all controllers. We must ask ourselves, should the controller be responsible for creating an instance of the template engine class? The answer is no. 
A better solution would be to pass on an instance to our controller. The solution becomes clear. A system should be available for exposing this class to any controller that needs to render HTML. This type of system is referred to as dependency injection. Dependency injection is a design pattern for creating objects. It's not specific to PHP. It's a prevalent technique among various programming languages. Dependency injection has two jobs. The first job is to create an object out of our classes. The second job is to pass on these objects to our classes that need them. Let me give you an analogy. One day, you might want to go fishing. Before heading out to the lake, you will need some equipment. You will need a boat, fishing rod, and some bait. We would need to take the time to do research, buy the equipment, and catch some bait. It's a lot of work. We need to do a lot of things before we can go fishing. This is life without dependency injection. On the other hand, we can rent this equipment from a local shop. It's a hassle-free experience. We can go fishing right away. After we're done fishing, other people can use the same equipment. It's not our responsibility to obtain the equipment. We simply ask for it, and we're good to go. This is life with dependency injection. We can apply this analogy to the programming world. Whenever we're writing code, we will need dependencies. Typically, dependencies are defined as classes. What if we need an instance of a class? In PHP, we must constantly create new objects in our classes by writing the new keyword. If the object we're creating has some configuration options, we would need to add them in. Rather than creating instances in our controllers, we can leverage dependency injection to automate this process. If that sounds confusing, don't worry. We'll look at a code example in a moment. Technically, we don't have to use dependency injection. Global variables are another option for exposing data on a global level. However, global variables are considered dangerous since they can be modified anywhere in our script. Variables are not guaranteed to store the same value throughout the lifetime of a program. This is another reason why dependency injection is popular. It gives us the best of both worlds of having objects readily available globally while guaranteeing their value. This section is going to be dedicated to adding dependency injection by creating a container. In the next lecture, let's get started. In this lecture, we're going to create a class for a container. Before we do so, let's understand the job of the container. A container is an object containing instructions for creating instances of other classes. In our application, we're going to have dozens of classes. That doesn't mean each class should have an instance readily available. Creating an instance out of a class consumes memory on our machine. To be efficient, classes should only be instantiated when they're needed. Luckily, that's the beauty of using a container. The container is smart enough to create instances as they're needed. For example, let's say we had a container with instructions for creating instances of two classes, called A and B. I want to emphasize that the container doesn't accept the instances. It merely accepts the instructions for creating them. By storing the instructions, our controllers can ask the container for an instance of a specific class. In this example, let's say we wanted an instance of class A. The container searches itself for instructions for creating this class. If these instructions exist, an instance is created and given to the controller. Our controller never has to worry about how the instance is created. It's the job of the container to perform this task. Let's create a class to help us build our container. The container is going to be a part of our framework. In the framework directory, create a file called container.php. Add support for strict typing. Set the namespace to framework. Lastly, define a class called container. Our class is ready. Similar to the router, we're going to create an instance of this class from the application class. If developers want to use a combination of our tools, they'll likely want to access the container. Let's instantiate this class from the application class. Open this file. Add a private property called container with the container class as the type. Next, inside the construct method, Let's set the container property to a new instance of the container class. 
After making those changes, we can start adding dependencies. In the next lecture, let's outsource the dependencies in a separate file. In this lecture, we're going to create a file containing our definitions. The job of the container is to store a list of instructions for creating instances. In the programming world, these instructions are referred to as definitions. To keep our project organized, let's outsource our definitions into a separate file. Providing a list of definitions is the job of the application. Inside the application directory, create a file called containerdefinitions.php. Add support for strict typing. From this file, let's return an array. In a moment, we're going to grab this array. Before doing so, we need a property in our container for storing an array of definitions. Open the container file. At the top of the file, add a private array property called definitions with an initial value of an empty array. Next, define a method called addDefinitions. Inside the parameter list, we'll accept an array called newDefinitions. Lastly, let's call the dd function with this parameter. The purpose of dumping the data is to verify the container is receiving the definitions. In a moment, we'll store them. The next step is to call this function from the application class. Open the application class. We're going to set the definitions from the construct method. You may be wondering, why aren't we defining a construct method on the container class? Technically, we could handle the registration of definitions from the construct method, but there's one problem with that option. What if we need to add new definitions later in time? The construct method is only invoked once. For this reason, we're defining a separate method to handle this process. In the application class's construct method, add a string parameter called container definitions path. This parameter is going to contain a path to a file with the definitions for our container. It's possible that a list of definitions may not be ready. This is especially true during the early phases of development. In that case, Let's make this parameter optional by setting the parameter to null. Inside the construct method, let's add a conditional statement to check if the container definitions path parameter has a value. If it does, we can proceed to grab the array and pass it onto the container. Define a variable called container definitions. The value will be the include keyword with the container definitions path variable. After grabbing the array, we can pass it on to the container by calling the thisContainerAddDefinitions method with the containerDefinitions variable. The last step is to update the bootstrap file to pass on the path to our definitions file. First, let's define a constant to help us generate a path to the source directory. Open the paths class. Define a new constant called source. The value will be the following, directory dot slash dot dot slash dot dot slash. This path should point to the source directory of our project. Open the bootstrap file. Let's import the app backslash config backslash paths class. Lastly, during the instantiation of the application class, pass on the following path paths source dot app slash container definitions dot php. We're finished. All we're doing is creating a list of definitions in our application. These definitions are passed on to the container since every application will have different definitions. Let's test our work. In the browser, refresh the page. At the moment, the array is empty. If you don't receive errors, that's great. You've successfully outsourced the definitions. This step is optional, but can be useful for keeping your code base clean. In the next lecture, let's learn how to add a definition for generating a class. In this lecture, we're going to add our first definition for the template engine class. As we discussed before, 
The job of the container is to create instances of classes that can be made available to other classes. In our definitions, we must provide instructions for creating a class. The question is, how do we provide instructions for creating an instance? That's simple. We do so with a function. The idea of creating an instance from a function is known as the factory design pattern. But why would we use a function to create an instance? Wouldn't it be easier to create the instance and add it as the definition? Truthfully, functions add another layer of complexity, but there's a good reason for that. Not every class immediately needs to be instantiated. Every page in your application is different. Therefore, it's possible for pages to have different dependencies. If an instance of the class is unnecessary, there isn't a reason for an instance to exist. Instances of classes require memory on your server. By using functions, we can create instances at any moment by calling the function. Code inside functions aren't executed until the function is called. That's beneficial for our container. It doesn't need to store an instance. Instead, we can write a factory function that will be executed by the container when an instance of a class is requested. Let's look at an example by adding our template engine class to the definitions. Open the container definitions file. First things first, let's import a few classes. Import the framework backslash template engine class. Next, import the app backslash config backslash paths class. We're importing the paths class for the constant storing the path to the views directory. As a reminder, the template engine class requires a path to this directory for finding our templates. After importing those two classes, let's update our array. In the array, add the template engine class constant as the key name, with the value being an arrow function. Containers can have dozens of functions. Therefore, we need a way to identify individual functions, which is why the array will be an associative array. For the key name, we're going to use the class name. Keep in mind, each function should have a unique key. PHP does not allow for classes to have conflicting names. If two classes have the same name, PHP throws an error. For this reason, I think it makes sense to associate the function for generating the class with the name of the class. The class name is always unique. Technically, we don't have to use the name of the class. However, it's standard practice to use the class name as the name for retrieving the instance. Inside the function, let's return a new instance of the template engine class with the paths views constant. Congrats! You have created your first factory function. It is as simple as that. A factory function must return an instance, which is what our function does. For this example, we're using an arrow function. The value to the right of the arrow is the return value of the function. It's safe to exclude the return keyword. This solution is the same as using regular anonymous functions. I prefer to use arrow functions. However, if you think this code is unreadable, that's perfectly fine. You can use the traditional solution of writing anonymous functions. There isn't a difference aside from readability. Our definition is ready. Let's try refreshing the page. On the page, our function gets logged on the page. That's awesome. The next step is to add this array to the definitions array. This process is going to involve merging two arrays. In the next lecture, let's begin this process. In this lecture, we're going to merge two arrays. Let's look at the add definitions method from the container class. We have two arrays. The first array is the definitions array. The second array is the array passed into the method. Our goal is to merge these arrays to produce a new array of definitions. We're not interested in completely overriding the list of new definitions with the existing definitions. Instead, they should be added to the array. There are two options for merging arrays. Let's explore both options. Before dumping the definitions, let's set the definitions property to a function called array merge. The array merge function is defined by PHP. It accepts an unlimited set of arrays. The return value of the function is the items of each array merged into a single array. Let's pass in the this definitions and new definitions arrays. 
This solution works, but I think there's a better solution. Instead of using the array merge function, let's wrap the arrays with a pair of square brackets. Before each array, let's add the spread operator. The spread operator unpacks an array. Therefore, we're able to use it to merge an array into an existing array, like we're doing in this example. Both solutions perform the same task. The differences between them are readability and performance. The spread operator is slightly faster than the array merge function. However, it may be difficult to understand what's going on if you're not familiar with the syntax. The array merge function provides clarity as to the action taking place because of the function name. Feel free to use either solution. For this course, I'll be sticking with the spread operator. Before testing our work, let's dump the definitions property. Next, refresh the page. As you can see, our engine has been registered. The next step is to create an instance of our template engine for our controller. The next set of lectures is going to focus on this task. When you're ready, I'll see you in the next lecture. In this lecture, we're going to discuss an important concept called reflective programming. Before we get into this topic, let's look at why we should care in the first place. The overall goal is to create an instance of the template engine class. After doing so, we must provide this instance to the home controller class. We've provided the instructions for generating this class from within the container. As we know, the router is responsible for instantiating the controller. Therefore, during this process, we can use this opportunity to pass on the instances from the container to the controller. Open the router file. Scroll to the dispatch method. At the moment, the router does not have access to the container. To resolve this issue, let's add a new parameter called container with the container class as the type. Lastly, let's set the initial value to null. Technically, our application has an instance of the container. So, why are we making this parameter optional? Keep in mind, we're going to allow developers to use any of the framework's tools independently. What if another developer wants to use the router without the other tools? In that case, they wouldn't have a container. For this reason, this parameter will be optional. Before we write the rest of the code, let's pass on the container to our router from the application class. Open this class with your editor. Scroll to the run method. Pass in the this container property into the dispatch method. Let's go back to the router class. Our router has access to the container. The next step is to provide the dependencies to the controller. In our case, we're going to provide the template engine. This process should happen as the class is being instantiated. Set the controller instance variable to the following code. Container question mark container resolve class colon new class. Let me break down this code. We're using a ternary operator. This operator allows us to perform a condition and produce a value. The condition is written to the left of the question mark character. In this example, we're checking the container parameter for a value. If a container was provided, we're going to execute the code to the right of the ternary operator. In this example, we're running a method called resolve on the container. If the container doesn't exist, the code to the right of the colon character is executed, which instantiates the class. There isn't a point in providing dependencies when a container is unavailable. But what about the resolve method? The goal of the resolve method will return an instance just like the code does to the right of the colon character. The main difference is that it'll provide dependencies to the controller. Not everyone is a fan of ternary operators. They can be hard to read. If you don't like ternary operators, that's completely fine. Here's the same solution with conditional statements. The behavior is the exact same. I prefer ternary operators because there is less code to write. The last step is to update the container class. It'll be up to the container class to return an instance of the controller as opposed to the router performing that action. In your editor, open the container file. 
At the bottom of the class, define the resolve method. Next, in the parameter list, add a string parameter called class name. Keep in mind, the router is not providing us with the instance of the controller. It only provides us with the controller name. Now that we know what class to instantiate, we can look at its dependencies with reflective programming. This situation brings us to the problem. What dependencies does a class need? In our case, we know that the home controller needs an instance of the template engine class. However, not every controller is going to need an instance of this class. Sometimes, you may want to redirect visitors. Other times, you may want to handle file uploads. These types of actions are performed from within the controllers. In those cases, a template engine isn't necessary. To resolve this dilemma, we must be able to peek inside a class to know what it wants. However, all we have is the class name. This is where reflective programming can save the day. Let's imagine you are looking at yourself in the mirror. Mirrors provide a reflection of yourself. Being able to see a reflection of yourself allows you to put on makeup, shave your facial hair, or check your clothing. You can perform specific actions by being able to see yourself in the mirror. This analogy can be applied to programming. Reflective programming is the ability for a program to look at itself. It's not a feature specific to PHP. Dozens of programming languages have this type of feature. But why? Why would a program need to look at itself? It's for the exact problem we're facing. Our container doesn't know what dependencies are required by the controller. Therefore, it'll have to take a peek inside the class to understand what it wants. That's possible with reflective programming. PHP has a class to help us inspect a class. At the top of the container, import a class called Reflection Class. Next, scroll to the Add Definitions function. This function dumps the definitions property. It's not necessary to keep this line of code around, so let's remove it. After doing so, scroll to the Resolve method. We're going to create an instance of this class from the method. Define a variable called Reflection Class. The value will be a new instance of the Reflection class. The Reflection class is able to look at another class. The class must be passed in as an argument to the instance. Let's pass in the class name parameter. The return value is information related to the current class. Let's dump the contents of the Reflection class variable. Next, refresh the page in the browser. As you can see, PHP's Reflection API found our class. Otherwise, we'd get an error. Perfect! We have a copy of the class's information. In the next lecture, let's use this class to help us determine the controller's dependencies. In this lecture, we're going to validate the class with the Reflection API. If we look at the output, there's not a lot of information available in the class. Additional information is only available via the Reflection class methods. In the resource section of this lecture, I provide a link to this class. If you were to look through the documentation, there are dozens of methods. You can grab information such as the properties or methods in a class. Alternatively, you can grab the namespace. The list goes on and on. We're going to use these methods to help us determine the dependencies. In your editor, open the container class. The first step in this process is to validate the class, which can sound strange. What should we validate? Keep in mind, not all classes are the same. What if we have an abstract class? As we know, abstract classes can't be instantiated. Therefore, we shouldn't bother preparing dependencies. Let's verify we're working with a regular class. Before dumping the contents of the reflection class variable, add a conditional statement. The condition will be the following. Not reflection class is instantiable. We're using a method called is instantiable. This method can help us verify the class can be instantiated. If it can't, we should throw an exception. Let's create a custom exception. Since this error is produced by the framework, the exception should be defined by our framework too. Inside the framework directory, create a folder called exceptions. Next, 
create a class called container exception. Creating a custom exception is optional. One option is to use the exception class. However, custom exceptions can help with debugging by providing more information as to the error being produced. In this case, if a container exception gets thrown, we know the error has to do with our container. Let's set the namespace to framework backslash exceptions. Next, import the exception class. Afterward, define the container exception class. Lastly, extend the exception class. Our custom exception is ready. Let's go back to the container class to use it. First, we must import the class. At the top of the file, import the framework backslash container exception class. Next, scroll back to the conditional statement. Inside the conditional statement, throw a new instance of the container exception class. Inside the constructor method, let's pass in a custom message. Type the following class class name is not instantiable. We're injecting the class name into the message to help other developers identify the class causing the issue. Let's try testing our work. Switch over to the browser. The reflection continues to get rendered on the page. This means the class given to the container is instantiable. We can continue to grab the class's dependencies. In the next lecture, let's keep working on our container. In this lecture, we're going to grab the constructor of the controller. Our container is able to view information about a class. As a reminder, the goal is to find a list of dependencies required by a class. The question is, where should the information be found? It's common practice to list dependencies from the construct method. Let's take a look at the home controller. At the moment, we're manually creating an instance of the template engine class. Let's remove this line of code. The container will be responsible for providing an instance. Since that's the case, we must accept the instance. Let's do so during the construct method. Move the property definition into the construct method's parameter list like so. By moving the property into the construct method, our container can look inside this method's parameter list for dependencies. Let's open the container class. The reflection class has a method for retrieving the construct method of a class. Before dumping the variable, let's define a variable called constructor. The value will be the reflection class get constructor method. The get constructor method returns the construct method of a respective class. Let's hover our mouse over this method. According to the description, it's possible for a class not to have a construct method, which makes sense. If a class doesn't have dependencies, there isn't a reason to define the construct method. Before moving forward, we should verify there's a construct method. Add a conditional statement. The condition will be the constructor variable with the not operator. If the method doesn't exist, we don't have to bother checking for dependencies. Instead, we can instantiate the class and return it from our method. Let's return a new instance of the class name variable. Lastly, let's dump the constructor variable instead of the reflection class variable. In the browser, refresh the page. Great! The reflection API was able to grab the construct method. We can proceed to grab the list of parameters. In the next lecture, we'll grab the parameters from our method. In this lecture, we're going to grab the parameters of the construct method of our class. Let's take a look at the value dumped by our framework. Looking closely, the value is an object. The class name is displayed after the data type. The getConstruct method returns an instance of a class called reflection method. In the resource section of this lecture, I provide a link to this class. The reflection API has a dedicated class for retrieving information on methods. You can grab information such as the access modifier, parameter list, or return type. Feel free to read the documentation to learn more about this class. As you can probably guess, 
we're going to use the method for retrieving the parameter list. Let's give that a try. In your editor, open the container class. Before dumping the constructor variable, let's define a variable called parameters. The value will be a method called constructor get parameters. As the name implies, the method returns an array of parameters. It's completely possible for the construct method of a given class to have no parameters. If that's the case, we should return an instance of the class. There isn't a point in trying to check for dependencies. Add a conditional statement. The condition will be the following. Count parameters equals 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 zero. The method always returns an array. In this example, we're using the count function to count the items in the array. If it's zero, this means the array is empty. If that's the case, let's return a new instance of the class name variable. Otherwise, let's dump the parameters variable. In the browser, refresh the page. We've successfully grabbed the list of parameters. Our container knows that the home controller has a parameter called view. With this information, it'll be able to instantiate the class for this parameter and pass it onto the controller. So far, so good. In the next lecture, let's perform validation on the parameters. In this lecture, we're going to validate the parameters retrieved by the getParameters method. Parameters come in all shapes and sizes. They can be null, have a default value, or they may have a data type. In our function, we have an array of parameters. However, we may be unable to provide values for each of them. Therefore, I think we should perform validation on the parameters. To get started, open the container class. We're going to need a few classes. Import a class called Reflection Named Type. I'll talk about this class later. We're going to need it in a few minutes. To save time, we're importing it now instead of later. Let's scroll to the Resolve method. Previously, we left off grabbing the parameters. Let's loop through the array to perform validation. Before the dump function, define a variable called dependencies with an initial value of an empty array. The dependencies variable is going to store the instances or dependencies required by our controller. At the moment, we only have the array of parameters. The goal is to loop through each parameter. As we do so, we'll create an instance for the respective parameter. Let's create a for each loop to initiate this process. The expression will be the following, params as param. Let's stop for a moment to examine the code we've written thus far. Hover your mouse over the param variable. Our editor has set the data type of this variable to reflection parameter. But why? To find out the answer, you can hover your mouse over the get parameters method. According to the description, the return value of this method is an array of instances of the reflection parameter class. Therefore, we can assume the param variable is an instance of the reflection parameter class. It's always important to examine the types of your variables. By doing so, you'll have a better understanding of what's available to you. In this case, the reflection parameter class has methods for viewing information on a specific parameter. Let's extract the information into a variable. There are two pieces of information we're going to need. Firstly, let's grab the name of the parameter. Define a variable called name. The value will be the param get name. Keep in mind, our goal is to validate the parameters. If a parameter fails validation, we're going to need the name for the error message. The name is going to appear in the error. Otherwise, we won't know which parameter failed validation. After this variable, create another variable called type. The value will be a method called param get type. We're going to validate the data type of the parameter. If the data type is a string or boolean, we won't be able to instantiate a class for this parameter. We'll only accept classes as type hints for parameters. With this information, we can begin validation. Add a conditional statement. 
the condition will be the following, not type. Let's hover our mouse over the getType method. If we look at the possible return values, one of the results can be null. Parameter type hinting is completely optional. If a developer forgets to add a type hint, we won't be able to instantiate a class from the container. Our container is going to rely on the data type of a parameter to retrieve the correct instance. Therefore, we should enforce type hinting. If the type hint doesn't exist, let's throw a new instance of the container exception class. The error message will be the following, failed to resolve class class name because param name is missing a type hint. Let's keep going. Next, we're going to validate the type hint. Add another conditional statement. The condition will be the following, not type instance of reflection named type. Once again, hover your mouse over the type variable. The type variable can be an instance of the reflection named type, reflection union type, or reflection intersection type class. A parameter has the reflection named type when there is only one type hint. The reflection union type class is applied to parameters with union types. Lastly, the reflection intersection type class is applied to parameters with intersections. Intersections are a feature we haven't gone over in PHP. For our container, we're not going to support complex type hinting. We will only allow parameters with a single type. Therefore, this condition checks if the variable is not an instance of the reflection named type. If it isn't, the parameter fails validation. However, we're not finished yet. Add the following to the condition. Or type is built in. The isBuiltIn method is available for checking if the parameter is using PHP's built-in data types, such as strings, booleans, or arrays. If it is, we can assume the data type is not a class. Therefore, we can't generate a dependency for the controller. If either of the conditions pass, let's throw a new container exception. The message will be the following failed to resolve class class name because invalid param name. There are only two validations we're going to perform. There's additional validation we could perform, but I'm happy with what we have. Let's try testing our work by refreshing the page. The array of parameters continues to appear on this page. This means PHP was able to loop through the parameters without encountering a problem. We shouldn't be receiving exceptions from our class. Great! In the next lecture, let's start instantiating the dependencies. In this lecture, we're finally going to create instances from the parameters of the construct method. But how? Let's take a look at the container definitions file. In this file, we have an array of factory functions. The most important detail is the key name for each item in the array. The key acts as an ID for the dependency. Since we may have dozens of dependencies, our container needs a way to identify each factory function. Otherwise, it won't be able to call the correct factory function for generating a dependency. For the ID, we're using the class name, which is an important detail. In the past few lectures, We've written a lot of code to retrieve the parameters of a controller's constructor method. The reason is simple. Parameters can have type hints. Class names are allowed to be used as type hints for a parameter. Hopefully, you're starting to connect the dots. As we loop through the parameters, we're going to use the parameter type to check if a factory function exists for that type. If it does, we'll invoke the respective factory function, which returns an instance of the same class. The instance will then be passed onto the controller as it is instantiated. Let's write the logic. Open the container file. We're going to outsource the logic for grabbing a dependency from the container in a separate method. At the bottom of the class, define a method called get. The get method is going to return an instance of any dependency. First, it's going to need the name of the dependency. In the parameter list, Add a string parameter called id. 
The ID parameter should point to a specific item in our array by its key. First, let's validate the ID. It's possible that there isn't a dependency with this ID. Add a conditional statement. The condition will be the following. Not array key exists. ID this definitions. The array key exists function can check an array for a key with a specific name. There are two arguments. The first is the name of the key, which happens to be the ID argument. The second argument is the array. In this example, we're checking our array of definitions for an item with the ID passed into the method. If the array doesn't contain a key with the name of our ID, let's throw a new instance of the container exception class. For the message, type the following. Class ID does not exist in container. If the item does exist in our array, we can proceed to create the instance. After the conditional statement, define a variable called factory. The value will be the this definitions ID variable. As a reminder, the items in an array are factory functions, hence why we're using the name factory. If we want the dependency, we must invoke the function. Below this variable, define a variable called dependency. Its value will be the return value of the factory function. Lastly, we can return the dependency variable from our method. Overall, this method instantiates and returns an instance from our container. The next step is to call this function from our resolve method. Scroll to the loop. At the end of the loop, we're going to push the instance into the dependencies array. We can do so by setting the dependencies array to the following value. This get type get name. In this example, we're calling the get method. Since it requires an ID, we're passing along the name of the type associated with the current parameter. Since our parameters are type hinted with our classes, the container shouldn't have a problem finding a class. The factory functions in our container use the class name as the ID. Finding a match should be possible. Let's verify an instance was created. After the loop, let's dump the dependencies array. Next, refresh the page. Voila! The dependencies array contains an instance of the template engine class. With this instance, we can pass it on to our controller. In the next lecture, we're going to instantiate the controller with its dependencies. In this lecture, we're going to provide our controllers with the dependencies resolved by our container. This step is going to be easy. For the past few lectures, we've taken care of most of the steps. In your editor, open the container class. We're going to be working from inside the resolve method. At the bottom of the method, we're going to replace the dump function with the reflection class new instance arguments method. The reflection API is not limited to inspecting the structure of a class. We can use it to create new instances. The new instance arguments method is available for instantiating the class being reflected. It accepts an array of arguments that can be passed onto the construct method of the class. The return value is a new instance. Let's return this instance from our method. That's it. With a single line of code, we have a new instance. Let's try testing our application. Switch to the browser to refresh the page. As you can see, the home page renders normally. Let me recap what's going on in our application. Our framework supports dependency injection. Dependency injection works by scanning the list dependencies from within the construct methods parameter list. Before an instance of the home controller class is created, the container can view the list of parameters. During this process, it'll look at the data type. It's very important for our parameters to have a data type. It'll compare the data type of our parameters with the list of definitions. If there's a match, the corresponding factory function gets called, and the instance returned by the function is assigned as the value to the parameter. After all, dependencies have been created. The instance of the controller is created along with the array of dependencies. In my opinion, this solution is much more elegant. It's less code to write. Our controller is no longer responsible for creating instances of classes. 
If it needs a dependency, all it has to do is ask for it from the container by listing it inside the construct method. Of course, the dependency must have a factory definition inside the array of definitions. As long as there's a definition, the container will be capable of producing the dependency. There's one more thing I want to do before moving on. Let's navigate to the About page. This page continues to render normally. However, there's one problem. In your editor, open the About controller. If we look at the code, the controller is instantiating the template engine class. It doesn't need to do this anymore. As a mini exercise, I want you to refactor the controller to inject the engine instead of creating the instance itself. Pause the video and give it a try. Good luck! Welcome back. Hopefully, you were able to refactor the class. Let me quickly walk through the solution. Firstly, we must move the property definitions inside the construct method. Afterward, we can remove the code inside the construct method. That's it. Let's refresh the About page to check our work. As you can see, the page continues to render like it did before. The only difference is that the template engine instance is provided to our class. Pretty cool, right? There's one more feature I want to add to our container. In the next lecture, let's work on it. In this lecture, we're going to deviate from the container to implement a completely different feature in our framework called middleware. There's one problem with our container, but the problem won't be easy to explain without an example. Unfortunately, we don't have an easy way to produce the example without working on our framework. This is common in development. Some bugs won't be apparent until you start scaling your application. As you scale your project, errors will pop up, giving you an opportunity to address them. In our case, we must add support for middleware to understand the issues with our container. Middleware is a concept found in most frameworks. In a nutshell, they're a feature for running functions before and after a controller handles a request. At the moment, code inside a controller only gets executed for a specific request. But what if we want to execute code on every request? We have a router. Its job is to determine which controller to call for a specific request. From there, our controller starts preparing a response. After the response has been prepared, our controller outputs the response. That's important to note. In some cases, we may want to run additional code before the response is given to a controller. That's possible with middleware. There are functions executed before a controller. The interesting feature of middleware is that it'll always run for every request. They're not tied to a specific controller or route. Technically, we don't need middleware to execute code before a controller is executed. We have complete control over the flow of our code. With that being said, it's considered good practice to split our code base into separate files. Without a proper system in place, our code base can easily become cluttered. Middleware is considered the standard solution for executing code before a controller is executed. Another common feature of middleware is being able to run functions after a response has been generated. You'll find this feature in most frameworks. For this project, we're not going to be adding this feature for the sake of simplicity. We'll keep it simple by only supporting functions before a controller is executed. Before we start implementing middleware, let's create a scenario where we'll need middleware. In your editor, open the home controller. In every controller, we're forcing the controller to render a page with a title. Let's check out what happens when we remove the title from the array completely. Switch over to the browser to refresh the page. As you can see, we have received a blank page. That's not a good thing. Requiring data to be submitted with a template can be an issue. Our controller should not be forced to submit specific data. Since a title will be common on every page, I think it makes sense to provide a title with middleware. This way, the responsibility of customizing the title is the job of middleware and not controllers. In the next set of lectures, we're going to focus on extending our framework to use middleware. When you're ready, I'll see you there. In this lecture, we're going to support middleware in our router. Typically, it's the job of the router to execute middleware, which makes sense. The router is responsible for running the controller. 
Therefore, it can also run middleware before the controller is invoked. In your editor, open the router class. The first step in this process is to store the middleware. Multiple middleware can be added to a router. Therefore, let's create an array to store the various middleware. In the class, define a private array property called middlewares. Set the initial value to an empty array. Next, let's define a method for adding new middleware. At the bottom of the class, define a method called addMiddleware. Similar to controllers, middleware is going to be defined as classes. The reason is simple. We want our middleware to have access to the container to inject dependencies. Controllers are not the only class in our application to require dependencies. Middleware may require dependencies too. For this reason, we're not going to accept instances of classes in this method. Instead, we're going to accept the class name. This way, we can instantiate the middleware with its respective dependencies. In the parameter list, add a string parameter called middleware. Next, let's add this parameter to the middlewares array. The router is ready, but the application class is going to need to be updated too. As we know, developers don't have access to the router via the application class. Currently, middleware can't be added to the router if a developer decides to create an instance of the application class. To fix this issue, let's create a method to add middleware to our router from the application class. Open this file in your editor. Add a method called addMiddleware. Similar to the router class, this method is going to have a string parameter called middleware. Lastly, call the thisRouterAddMiddleware method with the middleware parameter. Great, we now have a way to add middleware to our router. In the next lecture, let's update our application by adding a file dedicated to registering new middleware. In this lecture, we're going to create a file dedicated to registering new middleware. Previously, we created a file for registering routes to prevent our application from becoming cluttered. Throughout the course, we're going to be creating multiple middleware. We could have registered middleware from the bootstrap file, but to save space, let's do so from another file. Let's create a file. Inside the configuration folder, create a file called middleware.php. Add support for strict typing. Set the namespace to app backslash config. Next, define a function called register middleware. It's possible to create a class for registering middleware, but there isn't a reason to go that far. A function will suffice. Since middleware can only be registered through the application instance, we're going to accept the instance as a parameter. First, we must import the framework backslash application class. Next, in the parameter list, Add a parameter called application with the application class as the type. Our function is ready. Let's call it from the bootstrap file. In the import statement for the app backslash configuration namespace, add the register middleware function. After registering routes, call the register middleware function with the application instance. So far, so good. We have a single file for registering middleware. Before we can use it, we must auto-load the file. Since we're using functions, we must manually register the file for Composer to load the function. Open the composer.json file. Inside the auto-load files array, add the source slash app slash configuration slash middleware dot php file. Lastly, in the command line, run the composer dump autoload command. After running the command, the middleware should be officially autoloaded. In the next lecture, let's create our first middleware and register it with our application. Lecture, we are going to In this lecture, we are going to create our first middleware. 
The original goal was to create middleware for providing a title to all pages. This way, controllers can optionally customize the title. Middleware should always be created from the application. After all, not all applications are going to have the same middleware. Let's create a directory dedicated to our middleware. Inside the application folder, create a file called middleware. Next, create a file called template data middleware.php. It's common practice for middleware classes to be suffixed with the word middleware. Not required, but recommended to help other developers identify middleware. Like all files, add support for strict typing. Let's set the namespace to application backslash middleware. Next, define a class called template data middleware. Afterward, let's register the middleware. Open the middleware file. At the top of the file, import the app backslash middleware backslash template data middleware class. Lastly, Call the application add middleware method with the template data middleware class constant. As a reminder, we're not going to pass on instances to the router. The router will handle instantiating the middleware since our middleware may require dependencies. So far, everything we've done is nothing new. All we're doing is basic preparation. Don't worry, we're almost finished. In the next lecture, let's introduce contracts to enforce standardization. In this lecture, we're going to use interfaces to improve the developer experience. As we know, interfaces are available for forcing a class to define specific methods. They are completely optional, but can be helpful to developers using our framework. By providing interfaces, we can reduce the likelihood of errors for missing methods or typos. From time to time, you may hear an interface referred to as a contract. In the programming world, interfaces are considered to be contracts because they force a class to have a specific implementation. Similar to how you must fulfill an agreement in a real-world contract, a class must fulfill specific methods. In most cases, developers like to use the word contract over interface. In our case, they mean the same thing. We're going to create an interface contract for middleware. This way, all middleware will have the same method. By having the same method, we won't have to guess what method to call when executing middleware. Since middleware is a feature of our framework, the contract should be defined in our framework as well. In the framework folder, create a directory called contracts. Next, create a file called middlewareinterface.php. Declare support for strict typing. At the top of the file, set the namespace to framework backslash contracts. Afterward, define an interface called middleware interface. Inside our interface, let's define a public method called process. The purpose of the process method is to process the request. This is the function we're going to call before our controller handles the request. There's one more thing I want to add. In the parameter list, add a callable parameter called next. A common feature in middleware is the ability to initiate the next middleware. Our application is going to have a few middleware classes. Similar to routes, we're going to loop through every middleware class. They're going to run one after the other. Each middleware is going to have the responsibility of running the next middleware. But why? In some cases, you may want to redirect the user during middleware. For example, you can create middleware for guarding routes from unauthorized users. You can use middleware to check a user's permissions before rendering a page. If a user doesn't have the proper permissions, they should be redirected away from the current page. As a result, you should stop executing the chain of middleware from running and redirect the user. By being able to accept the next middleware, you have the power to stop or move on to the next middleware. The next parameter is going to have the callable type. This means the next parameter is going to be a function we can call to initiate the next middleware. Hopefully, this makes sense. If not, don't worry. 
we'll write the code for this logic in an upcoming lecture. For now, we're going to force all process methods to accept this parameter. Our contract is ready. Let's enforce it on our middleware. Open the template data middleware file. At the top of the file, import the framework backslash contracts backslash middleware interface. Next, implement this interface in the middleware class. Lastly, let's define the process method with the same signature as the interface. Perfect! You shouldn't receive errors from your editor. As long as you don't, you can consider the implementation a success. In the next lecture, let's start looping through our middleware from the router. In this lecture, we're going to learn a simple technique for chaining callback functions. For this example, we're going to step away from our project. I want to focus on this concept before applying it to our router. Currently, I'm using Replit. I have an empty PHP file. The goal of this lecture is to create a chain of functions. We're going to invoke the chain, which will cause each function to run. Let's start by defining a function to initiate the chain. Define a variable called a with an initial value of an anonymous function. Inside the function, let's echo main content with a break element. Lastly, let's invoke the function. As expected, the message appears on the page. You may be wondering, why are we storing the function in a variable? As mentioned before, we're going to create a chain of functions. As we do so, we're going to allow the first function to call the next function as opposed to waiting for the loop to finish running. You'll see the benefit of this behavior in a moment. Let's create an array of functions. Define an array called functions. Next, inside the array, define three functions. In each function, I'm going to output the letters A through C with a break element. Afterward, let's loop through the array with a for each loop. I'm going to refer to each item in the array as function. In this loop, we're going to override the action variable. The value will be an arrow function. The arrow function will invoke the current function. Initially, this code might seem strange. By overriding the action, the main content no longer gets rendered. As you can see, the letter C gets rendered on the page. This is because the last function echoes this letter. Therefore, it's the last function to override the action variable. That's not exactly what we want. After the last function runs, the next function should run. So, how do we solve this problem? One solution is to pass on the function being overridden to the new function. Let's pass on the action variable to the function variable like so. Next, we must update our functions to accept the previous action. In each function, let's refer to each function as next. Lastly, let's call the next function after echoing the letters. After making those changes, the entire list of letters appears on the page. As you can see, by passing on the previous function, we're still able to invoke it. It can seem confusing to wrap your head around this concept since we're passing functions from within functions and invoking them. We're doing a lot of work just to execute an array of functions. So, why would we choose this approach over a simpler loop? There's one reason. By passing on the next function, we have the option of executing additional code after the main content has been rendered. For example, in the first function, Let's echo the following after the next function, after main content. On the page, the message appears after the main content has been rendered. We're able to execute code before or after the main content has been rendered, thus giving us more control over the flow of content. We're not forced to strictly execute code before the main content. In a nutshell, this is the power of middleware. We're going to apply this same logic to our framework. Instead of regular functions, we're going to take it a step further by using classes. In the next lecture, let's apply the same feature.
In this lecture, we're going to start looping through the middleware. Similar to what we saw in the last lecture, we're going to pass on the previous middleware to the current middleware, thus creating a chain of middleware. Eventually, we're going to reach our controller, which will always be the last class to run its logic. In your editor, open the router file. We're going to modify the way routes are dispatched. Inside the loop, let's start by not invoking the controller immediately. Middleware should run before the controller renders contents. Let's store the invocation of the controller in a variable called action. The value will be an arrow function that'll have the invocation as the body. Next, let's invoke the action variable. Lastly, add a return statement. We're adding the return statement to prevent another route from becoming active. It's a precaution we forgot to take when developing the router. The code we've written results in the same behavior as before. Let's add middleware into the mix. Before invoking the action function, let's create a for each loop. Let's loop through the middleware's array. Each item in the array will be referred to as middleware. Before using middleware, we must instantiate them. As a reminder, we only have the class name. Define a variable called middleware instance. Its value will be a new instance of the middleware variable. After defining the instance, we can override the action with middleware. Let's set the action variable to an arrow function. In the arrow function, we're going to call the middleware instance process method. Our middleware expects the next middleware to be passed on, which is stored in the action variable. Let's pass it into the method. That's it. The code we've written will cause the chain of middleware to run. The controller will always be the last class to execute its logic. To test our middleware, open the template data middleware. Inside the process method, let's echo a message. Next, refresh the page. As you can see, the message gets rendered on the page. However, the error message has disappeared. Despite the appearance of the error message, the page is blank. The reason is simple. In our middleware, we're not calling the next function, which means the controller never gets executed. Since the controller is responsible for rendering the template, the original error never appears. We've successfully executed our middleware. It has the power to override the request or execute code before a controller handles the request. In the next lecture, we're going to inject the template engine class into our middleware. In this lecture, we're going to support dependency injection in our middleware. The reason is simple. We have a class called template data middleware. The goal of this class is to add a title to our pages as an extra precaution. Not all controllers may customize the title. If we want to expose data to our templates, we will need access to the template engine. Luckily, the engine is accessible via our container. Currently, only controllers can access the container. Let's add support for dependency injection in our middleware. First things first, let's update the template data middleware. At the top of the file, let's import the framework backslash template engine class. Next, define the construct method. Inside the parameter list, let's add the template engine class as a dependency called view. We're going to expect an instance of this class to be injected into our middleware. The next step is to resolve this dependency. Since the router is responsible for instantiating middleware, let's resolve the dependencies from this class. Open the router class. Scroll to the loop we created for the middleware. At the moment, we're instantly creating the instance from the loop. Rather than creating the instance manually, let's allow the container to do so by calling the container resolve method. Let's update the value to the following. Container, question mark, container, resolve, middleware, colon, new middleware. Similar to the controller, we're checking for the existence of a container. If one is provided, we can safely resolve the dependencies. Otherwise, 
we're going to immediately create the instance. Let's refresh the page. The message from our middleware continues to appear on the page. If you don't get an error, you're on the right track. We've successfully supported dependency injection in our middleware. It has access to the template engine. In the next lecture, we're going to add template data to the engine. In this lecture, we're going to start adding template variables. Unlike before, these variables are going to be available to all templates, regardless of what page the user visits. These variables will be accessible to any template. First, we must update the template engine class. We're going to define a property for storing the global variables. At the top of the class, add a private array called global template data with an initial value of an empty array. Next, we're going to extract this array in the render method. Otherwise, the data inside this array won't be accessible to our templates. After extracting the data parameter, call the extract function for the global template data property. It's important to extract the array after the data parameter. The data array must always have priority. Otherwise, controllers won't be able to override the title. Just to make sure, let's set the second argument to extract skip. This argument prevents existing variables from being overridden. PHP skips variables with similar names. There's one more feature to add to the class. Currently, it isn't possible to add new data to the array. At the bottom of the method, define a method called addGlobal. There will be two parameters. Firstly, we'll accept a string called key. Next, the second parameter will be called value with the mixed type. Lastly, set the this global template data key variable to the value parameter. This method will give us the opportunity to add global data. Now that our method is ready, we can call it from our middleware to register new global data. Open the template data middleware. We're going to update the process method to add new global data. Replace the echo statement with the this view add global method. The name of our global data will be called title. Let's set the default title of a page to the following expense tracking app. Last but not least, call the next function. This step is important. If we don't call the next function, the controller never gets handed the request. Only the middleware code will run. Let's test our work. Head over to the browser. If we refresh the page, the same error from the beginning gets produced. By introducing middleware into our framework, we found a problem with our container. There's nothing wrong with our middleware. The problem lies with the container implementation. In the next lecture, let's discuss why this problem persists and how to solve it. In this lecture, we're going to implement the singleton pattern in our framework. Before we do, I want to talk about why it'll be necessary for our case. Let's take a look at the error produced by our application. According to the error, our template is attempting to access a variable called title, which is undefined. Whenever you receive an error, a variable is undefined. The PHP interpreter is attempting to tell you a variable doesn't exist in your application. That's strange. We added this variable to the engine from the middleware. We already confirmed the middleware gets executed. So, why isn't our code working? To learn the answer, let's open the template data middleware. In the construct method, let's call the variable dump function with the this view property. Next echo a break element. We're not using the custom dump function to view the object. The reason is simple. I want to inspect the contents of multiple objects. Our custom dump function stops the script from running after dumping one object, which we don't want. I want to view the view property from the middleware and controller. Open the home controller. Same as before. Call the variable dump function with the view property. Afterward, add a break element. 
Viewing the engine from both classes is going to answer our dilemma. In the browser, refresh the page. Looking at the results, PHP has marked these objects as instances of the template engine class. We can conclude that our middleware and controller are receiving the correct instance. However, there's one small detail we shouldn't overlook. Directly after the class name, there are numbers. As we know, instances are unique from one another. Changing data from one instance does not affect data in another instance, even if they're from the same class. Behind the scenes, PHP assigns a unique ID to each instance to keep track of our application's instances. As you can see, both instances have different IDs. Hopefully, it's becoming clear as to why we're receiving an error. The middleware is able to add global data, but this data is only available to the first instance of the template engine class. The home controller has a completely separate instance of the same class. Therefore, it doesn't have access to the same global data. Our container is creating two unique instances, which causes inconsistencies in our application. This is why PHP is stating the title variable is undefined. To fix this issue, we must provide a way for sharing instances between different classes. A common solution to this problem is a design pattern called the singleton pattern. The singleton pattern states classes must be restricted to a single instance. As we know, PHP allows us to create unlimited instances of classes. However, it's completely possible to restrict the number of instances that can be created from a single class. If we attempt to create an instance of a class with an existing instance, we can force our code to return the existing instance instead of creating a new instance. In the resource section of this lecture, I provide a link to a site explaining the singleton pattern in detail. If you were to search online, you're going to find developers who absolutely don't like the singleton pattern. Some developers consider it to be an anti-pattern. Out of all the design patterns available to developers, the singleton pattern is considered the most controversial pattern. With that being said, it's not going to be harmful to our application. I think it's more than suitable. In addition, our implementation of the singleton pattern is only going to be applicable to the container, not the class itself. Therefore, it's not a true implementation. In your editor, open the container class. The first step is to keep track of active instances. After a dependency has been instantiated, we'll store the instance. This way, we can return the instance if it's requested by another class. At the top of the class, define a private array called resolved. The initial value of this property will be an empty array. Next, let's store the instance in the array. Scroll to the get method. This method is responsible for instantiating a dependency. Before returning the dependency, let's update the resolved array. Set the thisResolvedID property to the dependency variable. Since we're storing instances in an array, we need a way to identify specific instances. Similar to before, we're going to use the class name as the ID. The last step in this process is to check if an instance exists. This step should be performed before instantiating the class. If an instance exists, there isn't a point in creating another instance. After the first conditional statement, add another conditional statement. The condition will be the array key exists function with the ID parameter and resolved property. If this function returns true, an instance exists for this class. Let's return the thisResolvedID property from the method. By returning the method earlier, an instance of the same class never gets created. We are effectively restricting our class to a single instance. Let's refresh the page. As you can see, the page works normally. Let's focus on the output from the variable dump functions. Once again, both objects are instances of the template engine class. Most importantly, they're the same instance. This is indicated by their ID. This is why the page is working. Our template is able to access the global data, 
which contains the title. Despite the home controller not adding a title, our application was able to fall back to the global solution. If we look at the tab, the title is the value from the global data. Let's navigate to the About page. This time, the title changes to the value from the About controller. Controllers no longer need to provide a title, it's completely optional. Before ending this lecture, I'm going to remove the variable dump functions from the home controller and template data middleware. They're no longer necessary. With that out of the way, we finished our container. It took a lot of work, but dependency injection is one of the most commonly used and convenient features in the programming world. As we develop our application, it's going to come in handy. It's time to move on to another topic. In the next section, we're going to get started with form validation. When you're ready, I'll see you there. In this section, we're going to work on a registration system for the user. For most of this course, we focus primarily on the framework. As we progress through the course, we'll slowly shift away from the framework to develop the application. Our application is going to allow users to track their expenses. Before users can track their expenses, they must have an account on our site. Let's provide our users with a form they can fill out to create an account. First things first, we must prepare the page. At the moment, we only have the home page and about page. In the resource section of this lecture, I provide a link to a gist with the template for the registration page. Like always, I'm providing the template. It does not contain any PHP code. We're working with plain HTML. By the end of the section, this template will be dynamic. I've got an exercise for you. I want you to create a controller, register the controller with the router, and load a template using this code. These are steps we've gone over before. I think this is a great opportunity to practice what we've learned. Pause the video and give it a try. Good luck! Welcome back. If you were able to add the page, that's great. For those of you who got stuck, that's perfectly fine. Let's walk through the solution together. First, let's prepare the template. Inside the Views folder, create a file called register.php. At the top of the file, add the include statement with the thisResolve method. The path to the file will be parcels slash underscore header.php. After this statement, paste the HTML into the register file. Lastly, let's include the underscore footer.php file with the resolve method. Our template is ready. The next step is to add a controller. Inside the controllers directory, create a file called authcontroller.php. Add support for strict typing. Technically, we're registering a user's account, not authenticating them into our site. However, it's very common for sites to authenticate a user after they've created an account. For this reason, we're going to put the logic for registering an account and logging into an account in the same controller. Let's set the namespace to app backslash controllers. Next, import the framework backslash template engine class. Lastly, define the auth controller class with the construct method. To load the template, we must inject the template engine instance. In the constructor's argument list, add a private property called view with the template engine type. We're almost finished with the controller. The last step is to define a method for rendering the template. Define a public method called registerView. Inside the method, let's return the thisViewRender method. Pass in the register.php file. Our class is ready. The final step in this entire exercise is to register the route. Open the routes file. Let's import the auth controller from the app backslash controllers namespace. Below the other routes, call the get method. This page is going to be accessible via the get method. The path to this page will be slash register. 
In the second argument, pass an in array with the op controller class constant and register view method. We're finished. I know I flew through the solution. However, it's nothing we haven't done before. Let's try testing our work. Switch over to the browser. Try visiting the register page. We're greeted with a new page. It's a simple form with various fields. Typically, registration forms ask for an email and password. For this section, we're going to focus primarily on validation. Form validation is a critical step for any form. I want to be able to cover various scenarios, which is why there are more fields than a typical registration form. Now that we have our form, the next step is to prepare the data from the form. In the next lecture, let's update the template to perform this step. In this lecture, we're going to configure the HTML form. Before creating a user, we must extract data from the form. Luckily, this process is easy. To get started, we must modify the register template. There are a few adjustments to perform. We haven't had the time to discuss the template. Overall, we have a form element with labels and inputs. As I said before, it's plain HTML. Nothing about it is special. I expect you to be familiar with most of these elements. Our first step is to instruct the browser on how it should send the form data. This information can be configured on the form element. On this element, add an attribute called action. The action attribute allows us to send the data to a specific URL. By the way, the attributes I'll discuss in this lecture are not specific to PHP. These are HTML features. The value for this attribute can be an absolute or relative path. In most cases, you're going to want to send the data to the same page. Therefore, we can set the attribute to slash register. Alternatively, we can remove the attribute altogether. By default, form data is sent to the same page. Since we're going to handle the submission with the same URL, we don't have to add this attribute. I wanted to mention it in case you must send the form data to a different location. Up next, add an attribute called method. The HTTP method can be configured via this attribute. Something to keep in mind is that this attribute only supports two methods, which are get and post. We can't use put, delete, or any other method. Another thing to know is that the method's name is case insensitive. Some developers use lowercase letters, others use uppercase letters. I prefer to use uppercase letters since method names are formatted this way. The question is, should we use get or post? Here's a reminder of some of the most popular methods. The action we're performing is creating data. Therefore, I think it makes sense to use the post method. The put method is another option, but since we're restricted to get or post, the post method will be sufficient. Set the method attribute to post. After setting the method, we must prepare the input fields. During submission, browsers extract values from a form's input fields. These values are sent with the submission. However, the browser only performs this action if our inputs have names. Otherwise, our server will not be able to access values submitted with the form. In our form, let's add names to our inputs. A name can be assigned to an input by adding the name attribute. Let's add this attribute to the first input, which is for the email. The value of this input can be anything we want. Generally, the name should be unique, short, and concise. Let's set the name to email. Next, we're going to quickly add names to the other inputs. For the age input, set the name to age. Scroll to the next input, which is a select element. Similar to the input element, this element supports names. Set the name to country. Up next, we have an input for social media. Let's set the name to social media URL. Afterward, we have the password fields. Let's set the first field to password. The second password field will be called confirm password. 
we have one more field, which is a checkbox for accepting the terms of service. Technically, we don't have one for our site, but we're going to pretend that we do. Set the name to TOS. Our form is ready. Preparing a form involves pointing the form's submission to the correct URL, setting the method, and assigning names to your inputs. Let's try testing our work. Switch over to the browser. Open the Developer Tools by pressing F12 on your keyboard. If you're not entirely familiar with the Developer Tools, that's perfectly fine. They're a set of tools for debugging your site. I find them useful for front-end development. PHP is a back-end language. Despite that, it can help us with debugging our form. Click on the Network panel. The panel contains a list of files requested by our site. This includes the HTML document sent by our server. I'm going to clear the list of requests by clicking on the trash icon. If you're using Chrome, the button for clearing the list may be a circle with a line through it. Next, I'm going to fill out the form. Lastly, I'll hit Submit. After doing so, a blank page appears in the browser. That's to be expected. In our application, we have a route for the register path. However, this path is registered for GET requests. If we look at the network panel, the request has been labeled as POST. None of our routes handle this method. Therefore, the framework doesn't know how to handle this request. That's perfectly fine, as we'll fix this error in a moment. Our focus is going to be on the network panel. In the list of requests, one of them should be for the register document. If you click on this request, you're going to find more information. There should be a tab called Request. If you're on Chrome, this tab may be called Payload. Upon clicking on this tab, you will be presented with the form data from your form. Double check the data submitted with your request. All inputs and their values should be inside this list. If there is an input missing, there can be three reasons. Firstly, the input does not have a name. Secondly, the input may be outside of the form. Only inputs inside a form element will be submitted. Lastly, checkboxes are not submitted if they're left unchecked. If the TOS field does not appear, you did not check it during submission. After verifying the form data is being submitted, we can start intercepting the request in our app. In the next lecture, let's start handling the form submission. In this lecture, we're going to accept the form data submitted by the registration form. Our first step is to register a route. During submission, we received a blank page because we didn't have a route to handle the form submission. We must create a POST route. Open the routes file. At the bottom of the list of routes, let's make a copy of the register route. The routes are going to be similar with a few adjustments. Firstly, we cannot have the same route with the same method. We can change this route to intercept POST requests by changing the method from GET to POST. Currently, our router does not support POST methods. We'll have to adjust it. Before we do, let's update the controller. We must use a different method in our controller. Let's set the name of the method to register. Up until now, we've had a single controller and method for handling a page request. It's completely acceptable for controllers to handle multiple requests. As long as they're related to one another, it's considered fine. In our case, the route for displaying the registration form and handling the form submission is related. This method doesn't exist in our controller. Let's define it. Open the auth controller file. At the bottom of the class, define the register method. Typically, we would redirect the user to a different page. For now, we're going to display the form data to prove we've received it. Luckily, this step is easy. PHP automatically stores POST data in a super global variable called POST. Let's call the custom dump function with this variable. Keep in mind, this variable only gets populated when using POST requests. Our controller is ready. Let's update the application class in our framework. In this class, we have a method for registering get routes. However, we don't provide a way to register post routes. 
Luckily, it'll be easy to support a new HTTP method. Let's make a copy of the get method. Next, rename the method to post. Lastly, inside the method, we can set the method from get to post. Let's try viewing the results. Head over to the browser. I'm going to fill out the form and submit a request. The post variable is an array of our input fields. Just like that, we have access to the various field values. After receiving the data, the next step is to validate it for accuracy. In the next lecture, let's begin setting up a validation service for our application. In this lecture, we're going to start validating the form by creating a service. Services are another feature of the MVC pattern. More often than not, I find students are confused by the concept of services. So, let's take it one step at a time. First, let's revisit the idea of a controller. Controllers are responsible for handling the logic of a page. But, when you think about it, that's sort of a broad definition. Pages can range in complexity. Some pages render HTML. Other pages can upload files, validate form data, process transactions, or play a video. There are endless actions that can be performed on a single page. As a result, controllers can easily become hundreds of lines long. Most developers agree this shouldn't be the case. To avoid this scenario, there's a best practice called skinny controllers, fat services. The idea is simple. Controllers must only be responsible for receiving requests and returning responses. Everything else gets delegated to a service. But what is a service? Services are classes for handling any type of operation. This can range from validation to interacting with a database. By following this practice, our controllers are going to be small but have large services. That doesn't sound any better, does it? All we're doing is moving the problem from one file to another. However, keep in mind, a controller can have multiple services. Therefore, we're not going to have a single service bloated with code. Overall, Services are additional classes to help with processing a request. It's up to the controller to decide what services are used. Typically, services are created from within an application. It's up to an application to define services, not the framework. Let's dedicate a directory to our services. Inside the application folder, create a folder called services. For our first service, we're going to create a service for validating form submissions. Inside this folder, create a file called validatorservice.php. Add support for strict typing. Let's set the namespace to application backslash services. Next, define a class called validator service. Services are not tied to any controller. If you think about it, the registration form is not the only page requiring validation. Forms are common on most pages, which means our services should be available to any controller that needs them. It's common practice to make services injectable. Let's add this service to our container. Open the container definitions file. At the top of the file, import the app backslash services backslash validator service class. Inside the array, add a key with the validator service class constant. Set the value to an arrow function returning a new instance of the validator service class. Afterward, let's inject this service into the authentication controller. Open this controller. Next, import the app backslash services backslash validator service class. Inside the construct method, add a private property called validator service with the validator service class as the type. Let's make sure our application is working. In the browser, try refreshing the registration page. The page should continue to render normally. Since the page renders normally, we can assume the validator service was injected into the controller. 
it's time to start performing validation. In the next lecture, we're going to add a validator class to our framework. In this lecture, we're going to create another tool in our class for performing validation. That might sound strange. Isn't the purpose of the validator service to perform validation? If so, why are we defining another class for validation? I haven't taken the time to discuss when we would define a class in either the application or framework. As a general rule of thumb, frameworks should be considered tools. They should know the how, but not the what. For example, our router knows how to store routes and dispatch a route. However, it doesn't know what route should be available in the application. It's up to our application to register routes. The same idea applies to our container. Our container knows how to store dependencies and instantiate them. On the other hand, it doesn't have an immediate list of dependencies. Our application is responsible for registering dependencies. If you follow this general rule of thumb, you should have a good idea of where to define your logic. You won't always be able to strictly follow these guidelines. Sometimes, you may have to write the how logic in your application, but that's something you'll pick up with experience. So, let's think about our validation classes. We're going to create a validator class in our framework. This class is going to know how to perform validation, but it doesn't know what to perform validation on. It's going to be up to our service to provide data for the validator class to perform validation. Let's create the class in our framework. Inside the framework directory, create a class called validator.php. Add support for strict typing. Next, set the namespace to framework. Define a class called validator. After creating this class, let's instantiate it. Typically, we would add this class to our container. However, validation is going to be centralized in a single service. It isn't necessary for this class to be globally available throughout our application. The only class requiring the validator class is the validator service class. In your editor, open this class. At the top of the file, import the framework backslash validator class. Next, inside the class, define a private property called validator with the validator class as the type. Afterward, define the construct method. We're going to instantiate the class from this method. Inside the method, set the validator property to a new instance of the validator class. Great! Our application has access to our framework's validator. We've got a validator up and running. To test it, let's try passing on data from our controller to the validator. Open the authentication controller. Scroll to the register method. This method is going to be responsible for processing the form submission request initiated by the user. Currently, we're dumping the contents of the post variable, which contains our form data. Let's pass this variable onto the validator by running a method called this validator service validate register. Once again, our controller is not going to handle this logic itself. Instead, we're going to use a service for performing this task. The job of the controller is to delegate these tasks to services. It's going to need our data. Pass in the post variable. The validate register method doesn't exist in our service. Switch over to this file. In the class, define a method called validate register. In the parameter list, add an array parameter called form data. Next, let's tell the validator class to validate our form data. Inside this method, call the this validator validate method with the form data variable. Once again, this method doesn't exist. We'll have to define it. Switch to the validator class. In this class, define a public method called validate. In the parameter list, add an array parameter called form data. 
I know it seems like a lot of steps to perform validation. However, you'll be able to identify the differences between our service and validator as you flesh out the code. For now, let's call the custom dump function with the form data parameter. Before going further, we should verify the data is received by the validator. Switch over to the browser. I want you to submit the form with or without data. Regardless of what you do, the form's values appear on the page. If it does, great! We've successfully created a validator. It has access to the data submitted with the form. In the next lecture, we're going to begin creating rules to apply to our form data. In this lecture, we're going to provide a way to register rules by using an interface. Every application is different. Some applications may need to validate emails. Other applications may need to validate credit card numbers. Data can come in all shapes and sizes. There are endless variations and scenarios. Therefore, it's not going to be possible to validate every type of data from our framework. With that being said, there are scenarios more common than others. For example, emails are a common type of value to validate. I think it would make sense to provide validation for basic types of values. To keep our project organized, we're going to define a class for each value to validate. We'll refer to these classes as rules. The question is, where do we define our rules? Do we define them in our application or framework? The answer is both. As I said before, every application is different. Applications should be able to register custom rules for their specific needs. Our framework is going to provide a default set of rules that can be used in any application. If a developer wants to use their own rules, that's perfectly fine. Validation tools should always provide that option. There's only one problem. How do we ensure a custom validation rule is compatible with our framework's validator? The answer is with a contract. Since rules are created with classes, we can require rules to have specific methods expected by our framework. Inside the framework slash contracts directory, create a file called ruleinterface.php. In this file, declare support for strict typing. Let's set the interface to framework backslash contracts. Next, define an interface called rule interface. Our interface is going to require custom rules to have two methods. Firstly, define a method called validate. This method is going to be responsible for handling the validation logic for a single field. In the parameter list, we're going to accept three pieces of information. Firstly, we're going to accept the entire array of form data. Next, we're going to add a string parameter called field. Before performing validation, we must know what fields should be validated. Next, we're going to accept an array of additional parameters. Not all rules are going to be simple. Some rules may require additional information to complete validation. That additional information will be passed through this parameter. The last step is to set the return type, which will be a boolean. If the method returns true, we'll consider the validation a success. Otherwise, the validation failed. After defining this method, let's add a method called getMessage. If validation fails, an error message must be presented to the user. Feedback is a critical component of any form. If a user doesn't know why their form submission failed, they won't be able to fix their problem. This method will be responsible for generating an error message. It's going to have the same signature as the validate method. Let's copy and paste the parameters. Lastly, set the return type to string. Our interface is ready. Before we can use it, let's update our validator to accept new rules. Open the validator class. At the top of the file, import the framework backslash contracts backslash rule interface. 
Next, inside the class, define a private array called rules with an initial value of an empty array. Since the property is private, let's define a method called add for registering new rules. We're going to ask for two pieces of information. Firstly, add a string parameter called alias. Just like anything else, we need a way to identify a specific rule. Not all forms are going to have the same rules applied to them. For example, a form for registering a user is not going to have a credit card field. The alias parameter is going to store the ID. Next, add a parameter called rule with the rule interface as the type. The type is important. We don't want to add rules unless they implement the rule contract. Otherwise, we won't be able to use them for validating our forms. In addition, this allows for any class to be passed into the method. We're not asking for a specific class, but for a class to implement this interface. Let's begin inserting the rule into the validator by setting the this validator alias property to the rule parameter. We've finished our method. Our validator is able to accept rules. In the next lecture, we're going to create our first rule and register it with the validator. In this lecture, we're going to create our first rule. A common rule in validation is requiring a value from a field. If a value is not provided, the validation will fail. It's a very simple validation to create. Let's get started. Our framework is going to be responsible for providing this rule. As I stated in a previous lecture, rules can come from the framework or application. For our framework, we're going to supply a basic set of generic rules. Requiring a value is a common rule, so I think it would fit into our framework. Inside the framework directory, create a folder called rules. To keep our project organized, we're going to place our rules in this directory. Inside this folder, create a file called requiredRule.php. Add support for strict typing. Let's set the namespace to framework backslash rules. Next, import the framework backslash contracts backslash rule interface. Afterward, let's define the required rule class. In this class, implement the rule interface. A few errors are going to be thrown because we aren't completely implementing the interface. Our contract requires the two methods called validate and get message to be defined in the class. Let's define both methods with the required signatures. The last step is to add logic to both methods. Let's start with the validate method, which is responsible for validating a field. In this method, return the following, not empty data field. As a reminder, the data parameter represents the entire form. It contains the values from each field. Our validate function will only validate one field, which is passed in as the second argument to the function. In this example, we're checking if the field isn't empty with the empty function. If it isn't, this means we have a value, thus satisfying the validation rule. Let's work on the message. For the message, return the following value. This field is required. We're not going to go above and beyond for our error messages. They'll be generic and simple. Congrats! You've created your first rule. The next step is to register this rule with the validator. By default, we're not going to register rules with our framework. It's possible that developers may prefer to create their own required rule. If that's the case, there isn't a point in registering this rule. Every rule must be manually registered by the application. For our application, we're going to be using the rules from the framework. Open the validator service class. At the top of the file, import the framework backslash rules backslash required rule class. I'm wrapping the class name with brackets. Throughout this section, we're going to add additional rules. After importing the rule, let's register with the validator instance. Scroll to the construct method. 
after creating the instance, call the thisValidatorAd method. We defined this method for adding new rules. Two pieces of information must be provided. Firstly, we must provide an alias or ID for this rule. Let's set the alias to required. Next, we must provide an instance of the rule. Let's pass in a new instance of the required rule class. Previously, we would only provide the class name. However, our validator is going to be simple. There won't be a benefit to forcing the validator class to instantiate the rules. Therefore, I think it would be easier to pass on the instance. Our rule has officially been added to our validator. It can now validate forms with this rule. In the next lecture, let's start applying rules to our fields. In this lecture, we're going to apply the required rule to our form. Let's take a look at the form. We have a total of seven fields. For this form, we're going to require values for each field. Therefore, the required rule is going to be applied to all seven fields. In your editor, open the validator service. In the validate register method, we're calling the validate method on the validator instance. The only piece of information we're passing on is the form data. However, the validator instance is going to need more information. The validator class should not assume what rules should be applied to fields. Not all fields are going to have the same rules. Let's pass on the applicable rules as the second argument to the function. Pass in an array. In this array, we're going to provide two pieces of information. Firstly, we must specify the list of fields to validate. That might seem strange. Shouldn't we validate all fields? Technically, yes. On the other hand, the validator class doesn't have to be responsible for validating the entire form. We can have other classes for validating other fields. For example, we may want to validate values in our database. At the moment, we don't have a database. In a future section, we're going to introduce a database for storing users. A common feature for registration forms is to validate existing emails, which requires a connection to a database. The validator we're creating only validates forms. It's not going to perform database validation, which is considered separate from form validation. For this reason, we're going to explicitly provide a list of fields for performing validation. In this array, let's store the field name as the key. The field name corresponds with the values stored in the name attribute of an input element. The first field in our form is for the email. Let's set the key to email. Next, we're going to provide a list of rules to apply to this field. The value for this key will be an array of rules. It's not uncommon to apply multiple rules to a single field. I think it makes sense to use an array for applying multiple rules. In this array, let's add the rules we'd like to apply by using their aliases. We only have one rule, which is the required rule. As stated before, the required rule is going to be applied to every field. Try this as an exercise. I want you to add the fields to this array with the required rule. If you don't know the name of the field, you can refer to the template in the register template. Pause the video and give it a try. Good luck! Welcome back. If you are able to add the other fields, that's great. If not, that's fine as well. Let's go through the solution together. In the array, add the following fields. Age Country Social media URL Password Confirm password. TOS. For each rule, add an array with the required rule. The last step in this process is to begin validating these fields with the rules assigned to them. We'll do so from the validator class. Scroll to the validate method. Currently, we're dumping the contents of the data. Let's remove it from the method. Next, we must accept the array of fields. Only the form data is received. In the parameter list, add an array parameter called fields. 
For starters, let's loop through the array of fields. Validation is going to be performed one field at a time. Add a for each loop. The expression will be the following. Fields as field name rules. Every field in our array contains an array of rules, which we're referring to as rules. In addition, we're grabbing the field name as a variable. The field name is stored as the key name. Both pieces of information are going to be helpful for validation. Inside this loop, add another for each loop. Multiple rules can exist for a field. As we loop through each field, we're going to loop through each rule assigned to a field. For expression, add the following, rules as rule. The items in the array are the aliases of the rules. We're going to need the instance stored in our validator class to apply the rule. The next step is to grab the rule instance. Define a variable called rule validator to set the this rules rule variable. Since we're writing the aliases of the rules in our array, we can grab them by their alias. After grabbing the rule, we run the respective validate method. Add a conditional statement. The condition will be the rule validator validate method. All validate methods have three arguments. Firstly, we must provide the entire array of form data. We can pass on the data parameter from the method. Next, we must provide the field to validate, which is available via the first for each loop. The variable is called field name. Lastly, we must provide an array of parameters related to the rule. At the moment, we don't have support for parameters. For now, we're going to pass in an empty array. If validation is successful, we're going to move on to the next rule by adding the continue keyword. On the other hand, if validation fails, we're going to echo a message that says error. Realistically, an error message should appear below each field. That's something we'll handle in another lecture. For now, a basic error message will suffice. We're finished with our solution. Let's try giving it a test. In the browser, try submitting the registration form without data. As you can see, the word error appears six times. That might seem strange because there are seven fields in our form. The country field doesn't produce an error since a value is always selected by the dropdown. For this reason, one field passes validation while the others fail. It's perfectly normal. After confirming the errors are working, let's test our form for passing validation. Refresh the page without submitting the data. In the registration form, provide values for each field. Next, submit the form. This time, nothing appears on the page, thus indicating our fields have passed validation. Awesome! We've successfully created a class for validating our fields. There are only two things left for this section. Firstly, let's properly handle errors for validation failures. Secondly, an additional set of rules should be available. Requiring a value is the least we can do for form validation. Let's start by adding proper error handling. In the next lecture, let's begin storing the errors related to each field. In this lecture, we're going to store errors for fields failing validation. After submitting an invalid form, the user isn't informed of their errors. The only thing they see is the word error. Let's take the time to properly display errors to the user. The first step is to store the errors. In your editor, open the validator class. Our validator performs validation on the entire form. This means multiple fields can fail validation. As a result, we can have multiple error messages. I think using an array to store error messages is the best move. At the top of the validate method, define a variable called errors with an initial value of an empty array. Next, let's populate this array when validation fails. Scroll to the echo statement in our loop. We're going to replace this statement with the following code. Errors, field, name, empty, square brackets. Errors are specific to fields. It's possible to display error messages at the top of the form. 
However, I think it would be better to display them below their respective fields. This approach provides a better user experience. Users won't have to scroll up and down a page to read error messages. Since we want to display error messages below each field, we must store the field name with the error message. In addition, multiple error messages can exist for a single field. Therefore, we're using a multi-dimensional array. Despite our array being empty, PHP is more than capable of generating a multi-dimensional array with our fields. The value for this variable will be the rule validator get message method. Similar to the validate method, this method requires three arguments, which are the data and field name variables. The last argument will be an empty array. As a reminder, the get message method returns the error message related to a rule. After storing the errors, let's check for errors in our validate method. After the for each loop, add a conditional statement. We're going to use the count function to count the errors in the errors variable. Initially, the errors variable is empty. If it remains empty, the count function returns zero, which evaluates to false. Otherwise, the condition will return true. In that case, let's call the custom dump function to view the errors variable. Let's try testing the validator by refreshing the page. I want you to submit the form with invalid values. As you can see, our array of errors contain the error messages. Most importantly, the error messages appear within their respective fields. In the next lecture, we're going to throw an exception for these errors. In this lecture, we're going to create a custom exception for form validation. Let's take a moment to think about our situation. Who should be responsible for handling errors? Should it be the validator class? I don't think so. The validator class can stick to performing validation and generating errors. What happens to those errors isn't the business of our validator. Does that mean the service is responsible for handling errors? That's a better place, but not perfect. Errors can happen on any page. By handling errors from a service, the service must be available to all controllers. If the service shouldn't handle errors, that leaves us with controllers. However, controllers shouldn't handle errors either. Otherwise, we'd have to write code for handling errors for each controller. So, where can we handle errors? The best place to handle errors is from middleware. As we know, middleware is available to all controllers. By handling errors in middleware, we can update our templates to display those errors regardless of the page. The question becomes, how do we send errors from the validator class to a middleware? We can use exceptions. By throwing an exception, it can be caught. We'll catch the exception with middleware. First, we'll create a custom exception for identifying validation errors. Technically, we don't have to use a custom exception. PHP does have a generic class for exceptions called exception. The exception class is the most generic category available in PHP. It doesn't tell us what type of error we're encountering. Is the problem with the routing, the validation, or what about the template? By using the exception class, it's difficult to rely on the category to debug our issue. We must look at other areas of the error to figure out the problem. For this reason, it's considered good practice to use the other exception classes for a precise category. If none of the other classes suffice, we can create a custom category by extending the exception class. That's what I want to do. Let's create a class to categorize the error thrown by our controller. Inside the framework backslash exceptions directory, create a file called validationexception.php. Let's add support for strict typing. Set the namespace to framework backslash exceptions. Lastly, define the validation exception class. Next, we have to extend an exception class. At the top of the file, import a class called RuntimeException. In the resource section of this lecture, I provide a link to this class. The RuntimeException class is a subcategory of the exception class. In the code example, 
This class extends the exception class. Upon taking a closer look, the runtime exception class doesn't add anything on top of the exception class. You can click between both classes to notice they have the same properties and methods. So, why are we extending the runtime exception class over the exception class? It's the same reason as before. Technically, you can extend either class and get the same results. A large application can have dozens of exceptions. With so many exceptions, it would be beneficial to create subcategories. The more descriptive a category is, the better a problem can be debugged. But that doesn't entirely answer the question. Why use the Runtime Exception class over the Exception class? The Runtime Exception category was created for errors thrown while an application was running. They are errors that don't have to be fixed, but handled. There's a huge difference between the two approaches. Let's say we forget to add a semicolon to a line of code. This type of error has to be fixed. There isn't a way around it. On the other hand, not all errors have to be fixed. In our code, we're purposely throwing an error. It's not a problem with our code, so there's nothing to fix. We shouldn't modify our code to not throw an error. Otherwise, there isn't a point in using exceptions. Instead, we want our application to handle the error by catching it and producing a custom response. For these types of errors that should be handled instead of fixed, we can use the Runtime Exception category. If you can't find an appropriate category to extend, don't worry about it. It's perfectly acceptable to extend the Exception class when you can't choose a category. For our case, I think it makes sense to extend the Runtime Exception category. Let's extend this class from the Validation Exception class. Our exception is ready. Let's use it from the Validator class. Open this file. At the top of the file, import the Validation Exception class from the Framework backslash Exceptions namespace. Next, scroll to the Conditional Statement. Replace the custom dump function with a Validation Exception instance. Lastly, let's head over to the browser. I'm going to resubmit the registration form with invalid data. This time, our custom exception gets thrown, as indicated by the error message. If I were another developer, this information could be helpful. It tells me that the error stems from the validation portion of our code. In the next lecture, let's continue working on our exception to display the status code. In this lecture, we're going to update our exception to use an HTTP status code. First, let's take a look at our exception. In the browser, open the Developer Tools by pressing F12 on your keyboard. From the Developer Tools, view the Network Panel. Next, submit the form with invalid data. If we look at the list of requests, the POST request has a status code of 200. However, I don't think that's appropriate for our case. The status code should reflect the status of a request. An HTTP status code is a three-digit number to represent the status of a request. Browsers don't know if a request was a success. It's possible for errors to occur. What if the request was a success, but the server wants the browser to redirect the user to a different location? There are all types of scenarios to occur. For this reason, status codes were introduced to categorize the response. There are dozens of status codes. Generally speaking, there are five main categories of response codes. Firstly, codes that begin with one are considered to be information codes. In some cases, your server may take a while to respond. If servers take too long to respond, browsers may close the connection. To prevent that from happening, your servers can send a status code beginning with 1 to inform the browser the request is still being processed. As a result, the connection doesn't get closed. Up next, we have codes beginning with 2. These codes are for successful responses. I think it's pretty self-explanatory. Afterward, we have status codes beginning with 3. These status codes inform the browser to redirect the user to a different page. Moving along, we have status codes beginning with 4. These codes are for errors related to the browser. You may be familiar with the infamous 404 status code. This code is used when a visitor tries to visit a URL that doesn't exist. 
Lastly, we have status codes beginning with 5. They are codes for server-related errors. Sometimes, the server can experience issues. In that case, it's up to developers to address these issues. In the resource section of this lecture, I provide a link to an official list of status codes. As you can see, there are dozens of codes. Don't worry, you don't have to memorize every single code. I know it can feel overwhelming. More often than not, you're going to use about four or five codes per application, unless you're developing a very large application. In this list, search for code 422. The name of this code is Unprocessable Content. If we think about it, users failing to fill out a form correctly is a problem on their side that they need to fix. Otherwise, our server won't be able to process the form to create an account. I think this status code makes the most sense for our exception. Let's try using it. Switch over to your editor and open the Validation Exception class. We can override the code by defining a construct method. Technically, we can override the property. However, to provide flexibility, we should allow ourselves the opportunity to use a different code if we ever need to change it. Therefore, I think it makes sense to set the code from the construct method. Inside the parameter list, add an integer parameter called code. Let's set the default value of this parameter to 422. This is all the information we'll need. The next step is to invoke the parent's construct method. Otherwise, this information never gets used. We can invoke the parent construct method by calling the parent underscore underscore construct function. If we look at the methods argument list, the first two arguments are the message and code. We're not interested in configuring the other arguments. Let's use named arguments. Set the code argument to the code parameter. We're finished. Let's try submitting the registration form. If we look at the network panel, the code remains 200. This is because status codes must be explicitly set with a different function. That's perfectly fine. In the next lecture, we're going to catch the error. As long as the exception gets thrown, you're good to go. To reiterate, we don't have to do these things. We could have used the exception class and moved on to other parts of the application. However, custom exceptions provide for a better developer experience. It's easier to debug an application by categorizing errors with custom exceptions. Hopefully, you will agree. In the next lecture, let's continue working on our exception. In this lecture, we're going to create custom middleware. At the moment, we're throwing an exception, which generates this page. This page is only available for the development environment, which is helpful, but let's try customizing the behavior by adding custom middleware. Inside the middleware directory, create a file called validation exception middleware.php. Add support for strict typing. Next, add a namespace called app backslash middleware. Afterward, we're going to import a few classes. Firstly, import the framework backslash contracts backslash middleware interface. This interface is going to help us implement proper middleware in our application. Next, import the framework backslash exceptions backslash validation exception class. The class is going to be necessary for catching exceptions caused by unsuccessful validation attempts. I'm importing these classes ahead of time to save time. We won't have to scroll up and down our file. After importing the namespaces, define a class called validation exception middleware. Next, let's implement the middleware interface. This interface will make sure we're implementing proper middleware. We don't want to accidentally make typos. After adding this interface, we're being told our class is not properly implementing a method called process. Sometimes, you may forget how to implement an interface. If that's the case, opening the file with the interface definition can be helpful. Let me show you a cool trick for quickly opening a file. We can view the definition of this interface by holding the control button and clicking on the interface name. This action should open the file with the interface. As you can see, 
we must define a public method called process. This method will be called by the framework to apply our middleware. Let's copy this entire line of code and paste it into our class. Next, replace the semicolon character at the end of the definition with a pair of curly brackets. The definition has a single argument called next. As a reminder, we must call the next function to move on to the next middleware. Let's call it before doing anything else. Our middleware is ready. Technically, our middleware is redundant. We've only defined the bare minimum for middleware. That's fine for now. Our goal is to test if our middleware works. In another lecture, we'll add more logic. After defining a middleware class, we must register it with our application. Open the middleware file. At the top of the file, import the app backslash middleware backslash validation exception middleware class. Next, call the application middleware method. Let's pass in the middleware class constant. Great, let's try testing our middleware. In the browser, try submitting the registration form. Our site continues to work like it did before. The error gets rendered on the page. It's redundant since our middleware doesn't do anything. However, now that we have our middleware, we can use it to catch errors thrown by controllers. Let's begin that process in the next lecture. In this lecture, we're going to redirect the users to the register page after performing a form submission. That might sound strange to hear. Aren't we technically on the register page? If I were to submit the form, the URL states we're visiting the register page. However, it's important to keep in mind we're using the post method. Since we're using the post method, the original template never gets displayed. I think it would make sense to display the form again with errors. To display the form, we must send them to the same URL with the get method. We can perform redirection to handle this task. Redirection is a common action to perform. Throughout our application, we're going to be performing redirection regularly. Since that's the case, let's define a function to handle redirection. In your editor, open the functions file. At the bottom of the function, define a function called redirect to. Redirection can be performed by adding a header. This is not specific to PHP. It's a feature of the browser. In HTML, a document stores a head and body. Both sections are critical for a page. The head section of a document contains metadata, such as the page title and character set, whereas the body section contains the page's contents. Splitting information into sections is not specific to HTML. This concept is borrowed from requests and responses. A request also contains a head and body. The header contains information about the request, such as the user's IP. This also includes information on possibly redirecting the user. In the resource section of this lecture, I provide a link to an official list of headers. Headers can be treated as key value pairs. As you can see, there are dozens of available headers for various actions. Feel free to read through this page for the list of headers. Let's head back to our editor. Inside our function, we can add a header by calling the header function. This function allows us to add a header to our response. The first argument is the name of the header we'd like to add or modify. The header we're interested in is called location. The format for setting a header is the header's name and value. Make sure you're spelling the header the same as me. Headers can be case sensitive. For the location header, we can provide a URL or a relative path. Let's accept a string parameter called path. This parameter will accept the path to redirect the user to. Let's set the URL of the header to path. We're redirecting them to the same URL. However, the main difference is that the default HTTP method is GET. We're not finished yet. In addition to setting the header, we must set the HTTP response status code. We can set the status code of a response by running a function called HTTP response code. This function accepts the new status code. 
Let's pass in 302. The most common status code for redirection is 302. This code represents a temporary redirect. It's important to set the status code. Otherwise, redirection may not always work. There's one more step. Redirection is not going to allow us to do many things after we've initiated the process. I think it would be a good idea to exit the script to prevent an error from occurring. Add the exit statements. Our redirect function is ready. Let's call it from the custom middleware for handling validation errors. Open the validation errors middleware. First, we must detect an error. Redirection shouldn't happen unless an error gets triggered. Wrap the next function with a try catch block. Here's where things get interesting. As we know, the next function initiates the next middleware. After all, middleware has been executed. Our controller handles the request, since controllers have the power to perform validation through a service. By wrapping the next function with a try catch block, we're able to catch errors thrown by validation. Pretty neat, right? This is another benefit of nesting callback functions. We can write middleware for catching errors thrown by subsequent functions. If our controller throws an exception, we can catch the exception. First, let's import our exception class. At the top of the file, import the validation exception class. Back in the catch blocks argument list, add the error argument with the validation exception class as the type. We're not interested in catching all errors. We only want to handle validation errors. Otherwise, we're going to let other middleware handle the error. If the error is due to validation, let's direct the user to the registration page. Call the redirect to method. Let's set the path to forward slash register. That's it. The user should be redirected to the registration page. Head over to the browser. Try submitting the form with invalid data. This time, the registration form gets displayed. Perfect. We're able to display the registration form after an unsuccessful attempt to register an account. Believe it or not, this technique has a name called PRG, which stands for Post Redirect Get. It's a technique where a form is sent with a POST request. After the request is sent, the server forces the browser to redirect to a GET page. The pattern has the benefit of preventing users from sending duplicate form submissions. It's typically recommended to prevent users from accidentally initiating a request twice. In the next lecture, we're going to start providing the errors on our page to display them to the user. In this lecture, we're going to pass on the errors from our controller to our exception. Before we do, there's one thing I want to address. So far, you may be wondering, why are we going through the trouble of handling errors outside of the controller? That's a good question. At the end of the day, the errors are going to appear on the same page. The reason is simple. Our application is going to have multiple forms. Since that's the case, we're going to be performing validation on each form. This means repeating the process of displaying errors. If we were to handle most of the error logic from within a controller, we would have to copy and paste our solution to each controller. By outsourcing the logic into middleware and exceptions, we can automatically provide errors to all templates. The only thing a controller needs to do is throw an exception. Everything else can be handled by other classes. This is why we're outsourcing the logic. As we get near the end of this section, you'll see how flexible our solution handles errors. For now, let's continue working on our project. At the moment, errors are only accessible inside the validator class. The goal is to provide errors from the validator class to the validation errors middleware. By doing so, any code that catches the exception has access to the errors too. Scroll to the portion of our code where we threw the exception. We're throwing the exception, but the exception never receives the errors. So far, we've been extending the exception class with minimal customization. However, it's completely acceptable to add new properties or methods to our custom exception classes. For example, let's update the validation exception class to accept our errors. Let's pass on the errors variable to the new instance of this class. 
We're passing in the errors as an argument to our exception. This modification is going to temporarily break our code, because our exception isn't expecting this information. Let's open the validation exception file. Inside the construct method, add a public array property called errors as the first argument. We're deciding to create a public property for the errors to make them accessible outside of the exception. Let's try accessing this property from our middleware. Open the validation exception middleware. In the catch block, we're going to print the errors before redirecting the user. We can access the exception instance as an argument to the catch block. Before the return statement, call the custom dump function with the eErrors property. Let's try testing our work. Switch over to the browser. Try submitting the registration form with invalid values. As you can see, an associative array of errors gets produced by the validator. We've successfully passed on the error from the validator class to our middleware by storing the errors in the exception. Using custom exceptions can be useful for transferring information between classes. With this array, we can output a list of errors on the registration page. In the next lecture, let's continue working on error handling. In this lecture, we're going to make a modification to our middleware to redirect visitors to the correct page. Open the validation exception middleware file. In this class, we're redirecting the user by calling the redirectTo function. This is a custom function defined by us. Behind the scenes, we're using the header function to perform redirection by setting the location header. The location header is responsible for configuring the URL to redirect visitors. At the moment, we're setting the path to the register page. In future lectures, we're going to be creating forms on other pages. I don't think it makes sense to hard code the path. Otherwise, users would be redirected to a form they weren't using. They should be redirected to the page with the form they were working on. Luckily, we can grab the URL where a user was previously, through the server global variable. Replace the variable dump function with a variable called refer. Its value will be the server HTTP refer item. The HTTP refer item is a special value available after form submissions. It stores the URL where the form was submitted. Therefore, will always be redirected to the same URL with the original form. By the way, the name has a typo. Technically, the word refer should have two R's, not one. Unfortunately, the typo exists in the programming world. The PHP community has decided to leave the typo in to prevent existing applications from breaking. After receiving this information, let's replace the path in the redirectTo function with the refer variable. Next, let's try testing our form. Switch over to the browser. If I submit the form with invalid data, I'm taken back to the registration page. Great! There's one more thing I want to mention before moving on. The referrer item is a great way to redirect users, but it does have security concerns. In the resource section of this lecture, I provide a link to this header. On this page, you'll find more info on this header. There's a warning on this page informing us of potential security risks with using this header. If you click on this link, you'll find more info. I recommend reading this page to understand the potential issues with using it. In our case, it's not much of an issue. However, that's not to say our form is secure. In a future lecture, we're going to talk about potential security vulnerabilities with form submissions. I wanted to bring this issue to your attention to prevent you from being completely in the dark. In the next lecture, let's start displaying errors with the help of sessions. In this lecture, we're going to discuss a PHP feature called Sessions. We're currently facing a problem with displaying errors. At the moment, errors become unavailable after redirection. Sessions can resolve this issue. So, what is a session? PHP variables are stored temporarily. After a page gets displayed in the browser from a PHP server, the connection between the server and browser is closed. Once the connection is closed, PHP starts destroying data created during the connection. This allows for resources from your server to be free. As a result, those resources can be allocated for other requests from other users. 
It's beneficial as we don't have to worry about managing resources. On the other hand, not being able to store data permanently can be a problem. For this reason, databases were introduced to store data for longer periods of time. I haven't been frank with you. There is a feature in PHP for storing data longer than a single request. The feature is called Sessions. Unlike regular variables, session variables are stored until a user closes their browser. But why would we want to use Sessions? In our code, we're redirecting users to the registration page. Redirection is considered to be an entirely different request. Therefore, the errors stored from the form submission are lost after the browser reloads the registration page. We won't be able to render the errors anymore. To resolve this issue, let's use Sessions to store errors. Using Sessions is simple. Open the Validation Exception Middleware class. Before redirecting the user to the registration page, we're going to store the errors in a session. Write the following, session errors equals e errors. Sessions are accessible via a super global variable called session. It's an array of data. We can add data to a session by adding a value to this array. It's as simple as that. In this example, we're storing the errors from the exception instance to this variable. Unfortunately, this line of code won't work yet. By default, sessions are disabled. It's up to us to enable sessions. In the next lecture, let's enable sessions for our application. In this lecture, we're going to enable sessions in our application. Previously, we stored the errors in a session variable. However, that doesn't mean PHP stores the variable over time. Sessions are disabled by default. We must enable this feature to be able to use session variables. While not required, I think using middleware makes sense. Using middleware gives us the opportunity to enable features before a controller starts processing a request. Let's create a middleware. Inside the middleware directory, create a file called sessionmiddleware.php. Add support for strict typing. Set the namespace app backslash middleware. Let's import the framework backslash contracts backslash middleware interface. Afterward, define a class called session middleware implementing the middleware interface. Lastly, we must define the process method with the required arguments. In the argument list, add the next function with the callable type. So far, so good. Inside our middleware, the goal is to enable sessions. Enabling sessions can be performed by calling the session start function. Voila, you've enabled sessions. With a single function, we can use session variables in our application. Before registering our middleware, we must call the next function for the next middleware. Our middleware is ready. Let's register it from the middleware file. First, we must import the middleware from the app backslash middleware namespace. I'm going to update this line of code to include the session middleware class. Finally, we can register the middleware. Below the registration for the validation middleware, add the session middleware class constant to the add method. The order of our middleware does matter. Our exception class doesn't have access to sessions until the session has been enabled. Therefore, the session middleware must be registered last. Middleware registered last gets executed first. Therefore, it's guaranteed for sessions to be enabled before anything else. Let's try testing our application. Switch over to the browser. I'm going to refresh the page. Next, I will open the developer tools by pressing F12 on my keyboard. Initially, nothing is going to change in our application. Behind the scenes, PHP has instructed our browser to store an ID. I'm going to view the storage panel. If you're using Chrome, the same information I'm about to view may be found under the application panel. Browsers can store information from sites and applications even after navigating away from the page. There are various solutions to storing data from using cookies to local storage. Most of these features are for front-end development. It's not something you need to dig into yourself. 
The main point is that PHP instructs the browser to store information, which can be found on our browser. Search for a section called Cookies. Under this section, we're given a table of data stored by the browser. One of the records should be called PHP Session ID. Under the Value column, we have a random string. Here's another feature of sessions. Values stored in sessions are unique to each visitor. This presents another problem. How does PHP know which value belongs to which user? It uses cookies to resolve this issue. Cookies are variables stored in a user's browser. They're automatically sent with each request to our server. PHP uses a cookie to store a unique ID for our visitors. If a visitor has a session ID cookie, it'll search for the data related to this ID. This entire process is automated for us. By verifying the ID exists in our browser, we can confirm PHP's session feature has been activated. In the next lecture, let's improve this solution by handling exceptions. In this lecture, we're going to begin adjusting our session middleware to account for errors. It works, but what if it breaks? We're going to be adding more features to our application. As it grows, it's possible for our middleware to break. As an extra precaution, let's add a few checks to prevent potential issues. In your editor, open the session middleware. Above the session start function, add a conditional statement. The condition will be the following. Session status equals 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 PHP session active. The condition we've written checks if a session has already started. Technically, sessions should be started by the developers of an application. But what if you install a package with Composer that uses sessions? The package developer may accidentally start a session. Multiple sessions are possible, but that's not what we want. Let's limit our application to a single session. The session status function can be used to check if a session is active. We're comparing the return value with a constant defined by PHP called PHP session active. This constant represents an active session. If the session is active, we're going to throw an exception. I think using a custom exception will be beneficial for debugging the error. Inside the application folder, create a folder called exceptions. Up until now, we've been creating exceptions from our application. However, our framework doesn't use sessions. Sessions are a feature used by our application. In my opinion, it makes sense for the application to define the exception. Inside this folder, create a file called sessionexception.php. Add support for strict typing. Set the namespace to app backslash exception. Import a class called runtime exception. Lastly, define a class called session exception, extending the runtime exception class. We're not going to modify the original exception. Let's keep it simple by creating a dedicated class for session errors. Switch back to the middleware. Let's import this exception into our file. Next, from the conditional statement, we can throw a new instance of the session exception class to produce an error. For the message, write the following, session already active. If the session is active, we shouldn't start a new one. There's another scenario I'd like to handle. Sessions have restrictions. We're not allowed to start a session after data has been sent to the browser. PHP does not wait for a page to be completely generated to begin sending it to the browser. If we echo a string, the string is immediately sent to the browser. Even if we have more code to execute, PHP sends data in pieces. This feature is beneficial as it allows users to download pages right away as the page is being processed. However, this behavior conflicts with sessions. Sessions can't be enabled while PHP sends data to the browser. Therefore, we should check if data has been sent. Add a second conditional statement. The condition will be a function called headers sent. If this function returns true, the data has already been sent to the browser. Therefore, we can't activate a session. Inside the conditional block, throw the session exception. The message will be the following, headers already sent. I know you might be wondering more about this error. However, we're running short on time. 
In the next lecture, I want to talk about this error, because it's more common to run into than you think. In this lecture, we're going to continue working on the session middleware. Previously, we left off by throwing an error when headers had already been sent. As I stated before, sessions can't be activated when headers are sent. But why? Why are headers so important? Let me break down why this conditional statement is important, and how sessions behave. This type of problem is more common than you think. First, we should understand how sessions are added to the browser. At the moment, I'm viewing the registration page. Open the developer tools. Under the storage panel, search for the cookie. If you're using Chrome, this information can be found under the application panel. We're going to do something we shouldn't normally do. Let's delete the cookie from our storage. By deleting the cookie, the session ID is lost. Any data associated with my ID cannot be retrieved anymore. I'm going to switch to the network panel. After doing so, I'm going to refresh the page. Next, from the list, select the register request. A list of tabs is presented. Select the Cookies tab. Under this tab, we're going to find a list of cookies sent by the server. Behind the scenes, PHP checks our cookies for a session ID. If an ID doesn't exist, a new ID is generated. This ID gets sent with the response. Whenever a cookie is sent from the server to the browser, the browser stores the cookies. We can verify the cookies were stored by checking the cookies again. As you can see, the new session ID was stored. Once again, this process is automated. You don't have to worry about managing the ID or cookies. So, why am I bringing this up? Cookies are sent as headers, similar to how we redirect a user with headers. PHP uses headers to set the session ID in a cookie. Therefore, PHP needs access to our headers. However, headers are not always guaranteed to be available. If a header can't be added, sessions can't be started. As a result, we'll get an error. Let me show you what the error looks like. In your editor, open the session middleware. Before the second conditional statement, echo a simple message. Next, refresh the registration page. Everything is working as intended. An error doesn't get produced, because output buffers are enabled for our server. But what if it wasn't enabled? Let's say you're working on a team. Your teammate's environment may be different from yours. Alternatively, what if your production environment has output buffering disabled? If that's the case, an error will get thrown. I'm going to temporarily turn off output buffering. Above the echo statement, I'm going to run a function called OB and clean. Next, I'll refresh the page again. This time, our exception gets thrown. But that doesn't answer the question. Why do sessions care if data was already sent to the browser? You can think of the content for your page as a train. Sessions can be thought of as a passenger. If you begin sending data, this means the train is leaving the station. If a train leaves before a passenger can board a train, they'll never reach their destination. This analogy is similar to what's happening in our script. We're trying to board a train when the train has already left. By sending content, headers can't be configured. Therefore, a session cannot add a cookie to a header. As a result, the browser cannot store a session ID. This is why it's important to check if data has already been sent before starting a session. Otherwise, we'll get an error. To fix this error, there are two possible solutions. Head back to your editor. The first solution is to call the session start function before outputting content. That works, but it's possible to accidentally echo content like we're doing in our script. The second solution is to enable output buffering. Luckily, Output buffering is enabled on our server. In the resource section of this lecture, I provide a link for enabling output buffering. It can be enabled through the PHP configuration file. I'm not going to bother going through the settings, they're enabled by default. We can improve our current solution further. At the moment, our error message informs us that we're sending content too early. However, it's not telling us where the content is being sent from. Luckily, this information is accessible from the headers sent function. If we hover our mouse over this function, it accepts two arguments, which are variables for storing a file name and line number. These arguments are passed as references. Therefore, 
We can access this information in the variables passed into the function. Let's pass in two variables called file name and line. Even though these variables don't exist, they'll be created while being sent to the function. Inside our exception, update the message by adding the following. Consider enabling output buffering. Data outputted from file name, line, line. We're using string interpolation to output the variable values. Let's refresh the page. This time, the message gives us the exact location where the content was rendered earlier. It's coming from our middleware. Head back to the editor. Remove the echo statement and ob end clean function. Lastly, refresh the page one more time. As you can see, the error has gone away. Now if we accidentally output content before the session has started, we'll be able to catch the error. I know that was a lot of information to take in, but hopefully, you can appreciate the effort required to debug a program. In the next lecture, let's get back to the task at hand by displaying errors to the user. In this lecture, we're going to make one final adjustment to our session middleware. Sessions are active until the request is complete. However, what if we don't need an active session anymore? It's possible to terminate a session earlier, which can be beneficial for performance. Let's take a look at the session middleware. After turning on the session, we're calling the next function, which moves on to the next middleware or controller. After the controller receives the request and generates a response, does the session need to be active? I don't think so. Therefore, we should close the session after a response has been generated. After the function, we can run a function called session write close. As you can probably guess, this function instructs PHP to write the session data and then close the session. With this simple adjustment, we'll get a slight boost in performance. Let's try refreshing the registration page. The page continues to work as normal. If you don't get any errors, you should be good to go. In this lecture, we're going to inject the errors into the template. Let's open the auth controller. The method responsible for rendering the template is called registerView. At first glance, you might be tempted to pass on the errors into a third argument like so. This solution works, but there's one problem I have with it. We're going to be creating multiple forms. Constantly passing on the errors to the template feels redundant. Ideally, errors should automatically be exposed to a template. By doing so, we don't have to pass on errors to every template from our controllers. This behavior is completely possible with middleware. Let's develop middleware for exposing validation errors to our template. In the middleware directory, create a file called flash middleware. Add support for strict typing. Set the namespace to app backslash middleware. From the frameworks backslash contract namespace, import the middleware interface. Lastly, Define the middleware class implementing the middleware interface. As usual, middleware must define the process method. In the methods argument list, add the next argument. Lastly, call the next function. Overall, we have a standard middleware. You may be wondering, why is it called flash middleware? Flashing is a concept in programming where data is deleted after a single request. Errors should only appear once. After they've appeared on the page, there isn't a reason to keep track of them. So, it makes sense to delete them after they've been displayed on a page. This is known as flashing. The next lecture will be focused on deleting data. For now, the goal is to pass on the errors from the middleware to our template. To accomplish this goal, we must have access to the template engine instance. Luckily, we took the time to add the instance as a dependency. We can inject it into our middleware through the construct method. First, we must import the class. At the top of the file, import the framework backslash template engine class. Next, define the construct method. 
add a private property called view with the template engine class as the type. Perfect. The instance will get injected into our class. Next, through this instance, the goal is to add data to whatever template gets rendered. Global data can be added through the thisViewAddGlobal method. Call this method from the process method. This method has two arguments. Firstly, we must provide the name of the variable. Let's call it errors. Next, we must provide the value for this variable. Let's set it to session errors nullish empty array. In this example, we're using the nullish operator to check for an empty value on the left side. It's possible for a page not to have errors. If that's the case, the value will be an empty array. Just like that, we've exposed our errors to any template that needs them. After creating the middleware, let's register it with our application. Open the middleware file. At the top of the file, import the flash middleware class. Next, in the area where we registered middleware, call the add method above the session middleware. The order of middleware registration does matter. We want our session to be activated immediately. Otherwise, we're not guaranteed to have access to our session. Middleware registered last gets executed first. As long as the session middleware is last, theoretically, the other middleware should have access to the session. Inside this add method, add the flash middleware class constant. We're almost finished. I want to verify the errors are accessible from our template. Open the register template. Above the form element, let's add an expression. For testing purposes, let's call the variable dump function with the errors variable. Lastly, let's refresh the registration page. Initially, the array is going to be empty unless you submitted the form previously. I'm going to submit the form with invalid values. After doing so, the array of errors appears in the template. Perfect. Hopefully, you see the benefits of middleware. We can use it to manipulate the data and behavior of our templates. By using middleware, our controller doesn't have to worry about dealing with errors. In the next lecture, let's continue working on displaying these errors to our users. In this lecture, we're going to flash the error messages in our template. Let me show you the problem. On the page, I'm going to submit the form. After doing so, the errors are added to the template. Everything is working as intended. However, if I refresh the page without submitting the form, the errors continue to appear on the page. As mentioned before, session variables stay around until the browser has been closed. This means our errors are going to be available to other templates. That's not a good thing. We don't want errors to appear on the wrong page. It's up to us to manage sessions. To resolve this issue, we're going to perform a technique known as flashing messages. Flashing a message means destroying the message after you've sent it off to the template. This way, if the user refreshes or navigates to a different page, the errors go away. Let's open the flash middleware file. We're going to destroy the messages after they've been sent to the template. This file is the best place to write that logic. After the addGlobal method, run a function called unset. The unset function is defined by PHP. We can use it to destroy variables or specific items in an array. The variable that must be destroyed can be passed in as an argument. Let's pass in the session errors variable. Next, try heading over to the browser. If I submit the form, the errors appear. However, after submitting the form, I'll refresh the page. This time, the errors have gone away. They only appear after a form has been submitted, not overstaying their welcome. It's a simple technique, but can improve user experience and prevent unexpected behavior. In the next lecture, let's display our errors below the input fields. In this lecture, we're going to start displaying the errors below their respective fields. To get started, open the register template. This template contains our registration form. Previously, we dumped the entire array of errors. Let's remove this expression from the template. 
Next, we're going to start displaying an error for the email field. Below the input element, the first step is to check if there are errors. We shouldn't bother displaying an error if there isn't one to begin with. Add an if tag. For the condition, use the array key exists function. We're going to pass in the key name, which is email. The second argument is the array to check. Pass in the errors array. If this condition passes, we've got an error for the email. Inside the tag, add a div tag. On this tag, let's add the following classes. BG gray 100 MT2 P2 text red 500. For this project, I've supplied a set of classes to help you display the message. Inside the div tag, echo the errors email zero variable. As we know, the variable is an array of error messages. Multiple rules can be broken. Therefore, we can have multiple errors. We could loop through the errors. However, to keep it simple, I want to display the first error message. Feel free to loop through the errors as an exercise. For now, this solution will suffice. The rest of the errors are going to be the same. We're going to copy and paste this solution for the other inputs. For example, I'll copy this entire bit of code below the age input. Next, I'll update the expression to use the age variable instead of the email variable. I'm going to repeat this process for the other fields. You should do the same. All right, I've added errors to each of our inputs. Let's try testing our work. Switch over to the browser. I'm going to submit the form with invalid information. As you can see, error messages are appearing underneath our inputs. We've successfully displayed the error messages. It took a while, but it was well worth the effort. We've developed a system where error messages can easily be displayed on any page. In the next set of lectures, let's add more validation rules to our form. In this lecture, we're going to validate the value of the email field. Typically, emails have a specific format. First, they always have the at symbol. Secondly, they end with a domain extension. Let's validate the email. It should adhere to the rules I just mentioned. Let's get started. First, let's create a class for the rule. Validating emails is normal in most applications. I think our framework should supply this rule. In the framework slash rules directory, create a file called emailrule.php. Inside the file, declare support for strict typing. Next, set the namespace for framework backslash rules. Import the rule interface and define the email rule class implementing the interface. Inside the class, define the validate and get message methods with their respective signatures from the interface. Overall, we have a basic validator. Our next step is to perform validation for emails. Luckily, this process is easy. PHP has a function to validate values. In the resource section of this lecture, I provide a link to a function called filter variable. The filter variable function is available for two purposes. By default, it can be used to sanitize a value by stripping away unnecessary characters from a value. However, it does have another purpose, which is to validate existing values. There are three parameters, but we only care about the first two. The first parameter is the value to validate. As for the second parameter, it's the type of filter to apply. If we look at the description, there's a link for a list of filters. Click on it. As mentioned before, there are filters available for sanitation or validation. We're interested in the validation filters. Click on the validate link. On this page, we're given a list of filters to validate various values. One of the filters is called filter validate email. To the right, we're given a description, which states it'll validate an email. It's exactly what we're looking for. 
Let's give it a try. Switch back to your editor. From the validate function, return the boolean filter variable function. First, we must provide the value, which is the data field variable. Next, we must set the filter. In our case, we're going to apply the filter validate email. There are other ways of validating emails. We're using the simplest approach. Another approach would be to use regular expressions, but I want you to keep it simple. Let's work on the message. In the getMessage method, return the following string, invalid email. If the validation fails, we'll render a message to inform the user of their invalid value. Our validation rule is ready. Let's register it and apply it to the email field. Open the validator service. From the framework backslash rules namespace, import the email rule class. Next, scroll to the construct method. Let's register the rule by calling the validator add method. The alias for this rule will be email. Afterward, pass in a new instance of the email rule class. Lastly, let's apply this rule to the email field. Scroll to the validate register method. In the array for the email field, add the email rule. The value must match the alias name. That's it. We've got our rule. Let's test our work. In the browser, submit the form with an invalid email. Don't leave the email field empty. Otherwise, the required rule will get broken. As you can see, our rule is working as expected. PHP is not allowing the email to go through. Let's try testing a valid email. This time, the email was valid because it had the at character and domain extension. We've successfully created an email rule. In the next lecture, let's continue validating the other field with more custom rules. In this lecture, we're going to update the validator class to support parameters. Our form has a field called age. Let's say we wanted to restrict our site to users 18 and older. A common validation to perform is to check for a minimum value. In our case, the age should not fall below 18. Validating numbers is very common. The age is not the only type of field requiring numeric validation. Another example would be requiring a package to have a minimum weight. We may not want the minimum to be 18. As it stands, our rules don't provide a way to customize the validation process. It's not uncommon for rules to be configurable. Let's support custom parameters in our validation rules. Open the validator service. Scroll to the validate register method. In the array, let's apply a rule called min to the age field. This rule doesn't exist, which is perfectly fine. I want to demonstrate how custom parameters can be added to a rule. After the rule, add the following colon 18. Custom parameters can be passed into a rule by adding a colon character. The rule name will appear to the left of this character. The parameter values can be added to the right of the colon character. In addition, we're going to support multiple parameter values. Multiple values will be supported by separating them with commas. For this rule, we're not going to need multiple values. Only one parameter will be required. Before defining a rule, the validator class must be updated. It doesn't support parameters. Open the validator class. Scroll to the second for each loop. At the top of the loop, add a variable called rule parameters with an initial value of an empty array. Since multiple parameters can be added to a rule, we're going to store the values inside an array. By default, the array will be empty. Next, we must check the rule for parameters. Not all rules have parameters. Add a conditional statement. The condition will be a function called string contains. We can determine a rule has parameters by checking the string for the colon character. This scenario is what the string contains function was designed for. It's a function defined by PHP to check if a string contains a specific set of characters. There are two arguments. 
The first argument is the string to search. Let's pass in the rule variable. Next, we must provide the character to search for from within the string. Let's pass in the colon character. If the rule contains this character, we have parameters. The next step is to extract those parameters. Inside the conditional statement, run a function called explode. PHP defines the explode function. It'll convert a string into an array by splitting the string with a character from within the string. There are two arguments. The first argument is the string itself, which is the rule variable. The second argument is the character for splitting the string into an array. In our case, we want to separate the rule from the parameter values. Let's pass in the colon character. For readability, let's destructure the array into separate variables. Assign the return value of this function to two variables called rule and rule parameters. As we know, the rule alias is always the first portion of the string. Therefore, it'll be stored as the first item in the array. The order of our variables does matter. We're overriding the rule variable with the rule alias without the parameters. As for the parameters, they'll always appear after the colon character, which means they'll be inserted as the second item in the array. After grabbing these values, the next step is to convert the parameters into an array. At the moment, the rule parameters variable is a string. We'll do the same thing we did before. Set the rule parameters variable to the explode rule parameters comma function. Before moving forward, let's verify the parameters are correctly stored by dumping the rule parameters variable. Next, head to the browser. Try submitting the form. On the page, the validator class was able to successfully extract the parameters from the rule. Now that we have the parameters, we can start working on the minimum rule. Let's head back to the editor. Remove the dump function from the conditional statement. The validate and get message methods are going to need the parameters. At the moment, we're passing an empty array. It's no longer necessary to pass in an empty array of data. We can pass in the rule parameters variable to both methods. Great! In the next lecture, we're going to start working on the minimum validation rule for validating the age field. In this lecture, we're going to work on the minimum validation rule for the age field. The first step is to create the class for the rule. Like the required rule, this rule is going to be defined by the framework. Inside the rules directory, create a file called minrule.php. Let's set the namespace to framework backslash rules, import the rule interface, and define a class called minrule with the rule interface. Afterward, Let's implement the rule interface with the validate and get message methods. Our rule is going to have one parameter, which is the minimum threshold. Before we can validate the rule, we must check if a parameter was provided. If a developer forgets to provide a value for the parameter, we should inform them. Inside the validate method, add a conditional statement. The condition will be the following empty parameters 0. If this function returns true, the developer has forgotten the parameter. In this case, let's throw an error. At the top of the file, import a class called invalid argument exception. Typically, we would create a custom exception. However, PHP has an exception that is pretty accurate. The invalid argument exception can be used for errors related to invalid or insufficient arguments for a function. In our case, we're using the exception to indicate we haven't received an argument. Back in the conditional statement, let's throw this exception. A message should be provided for additional context. Pass in the following message. Minimum length not specified. 
After the conditional statement, let's begin performing validation. At this point, a parameter value has been provided. Let's extract it by defining a variable called length. The value will be the parameter's zero variable. During this process, I'm going to typecast the variable into an integer. Next, we can return the following. Data field greater than equals length. If the value from the field is greater than the length, the validation passes. Otherwise, the value is too low, which will cause the comparison to return false. Let's update our message. Inside the get message method, return the following. Must be at least params zero. We're finished with the rule. Let's register it with our application. Open the validator service. From the framework backslash rules namespace, import the min rule class. Inside the construct method, call the add method. The alias for this rule is going to be min. Lastly, pass in a new instance of the min rule class. We're ready to test our rule. Switch over to the browser. I'm going to submit the form with an invalid age. As you can see, the value doesn't pass our rule. Next, I'm going to provide a valid value. My value has passed validation. Awesome! We've successfully created a rule for setting a minimum threshold in our fields. In the next lecture, let's work on adding a validation rule for the country. In this lecture, we're going to validate the country field. On our registration form, users can select a country. There's an option for selecting an invalid country. Let's add a validation rule to prevent users from selecting an invalid option. We'll call this rule in. You'll see why in a moment. Head over to your editor. In the framework backslash rules directory, create a file called inrule.php. Declare support for strict typing. Let's add the framework backslash rules namespace, import the rule interface, and define the class with the same interface. Afterward, let's quickly add the validate and get message methods. The in rule will validate a value by checking if the value exists within an array of possible values. If the value isn't listed in the array, validation will fail. Inside the validate method, we can return the inArray function. This function is defined by PHP. It'll perform the exact action we're hoping to perform. The inArray function checks for a value from within an array. The return value is a boolean. Firstly, we must provide the value to search for in the array. Let's pass in the data field variable. Next, we must provide the array. We're going to accept the array of values as a parameter. Pass in the params variable. As we know, parameters are stored as an array. Any values passed in as a parameter will count as a valid value. We're not going to validate the value. I don't think it's necessary in case developers want to use an empty array to temporarily disable submissions. Before we use the rule, let's set the message to the following. Invalid selection. Next, let's register this rule with our application. Open the validator service. Import the inRule class from the framework backslash rules namespace. Next, in the construct method, add the rule with the alias in. We're almost finished. The last step is to apply this rule to the country field. In the validate register method, we're going to modify the array. For the country item, add the in rule. The form I've provided has a list of three countries. They're the following, USA, Canada, Mexico. Make sure the values are spelled properly and don't contain spaces. The values are case sensitive. We're using the same values listed in the forms options. You can refer to the register template for the values from our form. After adding the rules, we can finally test our selection. 
switch over to the browser. Try submitting the form with a valid country. The country field does not throw an error. However, let's see what happens when I select the invalid option. This time, the form informs us of an invalid selection. Our validation is working as intended. In this lecture, we're going to create a rule for validating URLs. The form contains a field for accepting a social media URL. We're going to allow users to link their accounts from our site. Validating URLs is similar to validating emails. You can validate a URL with the filter variable function. Since that's the case, I want you to create the rule as an exercise. Create a rule for validating the URL with the filter variable function. Be sure to check out the documentation for this function for a list of possible filters. It shouldn't take long to find the filter. Pause the video and give it a try. Good luck! Welcome back. If you are able to add the custom rule, that's great. If not, let's go through the solution together. Firstly, let's create the file. Inside the framework backslash rules directory, create a rule called urlrule.php. Add support for strict typing. Next, open the emailrule.php. The validation classes are mostly going to be the same. We can reuse a lot of the code we had for the email rule. Copy and paste the code from the email rule to the URL rule. Next, let's change the class name to URL rule. Afterward, let's modify the validate method. As mentioned before, we can use the filter variable function to validate a URL. All we need to do is change the second argument to the following constant, filter validate URL. If you were to look through PHP's documentation, this option is recommended for validating URLs. That's all you need to do for validation. Before using the rule, let's update our message to say invalid URL. Next, let's register the rule inside the validator service. Import the URL rule from the framework backslash rules namespace. Inside the construct method, add the rule with an alias called URL. Lastly, scroll to the array of rules for our registration form. For the social media URL field, add an item called URL. We're ready to test our rule. Head over to the browser. Great! Validation passed for the field. We're almost finished validating the form. The last field I want to validate is the password fields. In the next lecture, let's create a rule for verifying fields with matching values. In this lecture, we're going to create a rule for two fields matching. Our form has a field for adding a password. It's common to ask users to confirm their password to prevent typos. The goal of this lecture is to create a rule for comparing the value from the Confirm Password field with the Password field. If both fields don't match, the validation should fail. Let's get started. Switch over to the editor. Inside the Rules directory, create a file called matchrule.php. Next, set the namespace to Framework backslash Rules. Import the interface and define the class with the interface. Our editor is going to say we're not properly implementing the interface. So, let's add the validate and get message methods. As mentioned before, the goal is to compare two separate fields. Before we can compare them, we must grab them. The question is, which fields are compared? We're going to grab the field the rule is applied on in our form. As for the second field, we're going to accept the name of the field as a parameter. The value for the current field can be grabbed via the field parameter. Let's define a variable called field1 with the following value, data field. Next, define a variable called field2 with the data params0 variable as the value. Now that we have access to both field values, let's compare them. Return the following.
field 1 equals 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 field 2. In the scenario validation fails, let's return a message from the get message method. We'll write the following message, does not match, params, zero, field. For this rule, we're using string interpolation to add the field name from the parameter. We should always tell users which field the current field doesn't match. Let's register this rule. Open the validator service. Import the match rule class. Next, inside the construct method, add a value with an alias called match. Lastly, we can try applying the rule to the confirm password field from the validate register method. In the array for this field, add the match rule. This rule accepts the field for comparison as a parameter. The value must match the field name from our form. In our case, the field is called password. Let's try testing our work. In the browser, try submitting the form with two completely different passwords. Our validation was able to detect the fields don't match. This time, let's try using matching passwords. Voila! Our passwords pass the match rule. We've successfully validated the passwords. In fact, we're finished validating the entire form. There are additional scenarios we can cover, such as requiring specific characters in a password field. However, I'm satisfied with the current set of rules. You're more than welcome to add more rules. In future sections, we're going to add more rules for other fields. So, don't worry if you want to explore other types of validation. We'll likely touch on other types of validation, such as date validation. In the next lecture, let's address one problem with our form. In this lecture, we're going to pre-fill a form after registration has failed. It's not uncommon for users to fill out a form incorrectly. Typos happen all the time. Unfortunately, our current form is inconvenient. Let me show you an example. I'm going to enter a valid email. Next, I'll submit the form without filling out the other fields. As you would expect, the other fields are throwing errors. There isn't an error message below the email field. That's great, but the entire form has been reset. The email I entered is gone. I have to type it out again, which is a hassle. For the best user experience, let's update the inputs to contain the original values from the form submission. This way, users don't have to refill a form. To get started, open the Validation Exception Middleware class. We're going to do the same thing we did for the errors. The user's submitted data will be stored in the session. Next, we'll pass on this data to our templates. Lastly, We'll flash the input data so that the data doesn't persist across forms. We're going to fly through the solution since most of the code is familiar to us. First, let's store the form data in a session. We should only store the data when validation fails. Below the session variable for the errors, add another variable called session old form data. The value for this variable will be the post super global variable. Next, let's create a middleware to pass on this data to our template. Similar to errors, we're going to flash the form data. So, let's use the flash middleware to add to this logic. The logic for this middleware is going to be the same as the code for the errors with a few adjustments. To save time, Let's copy the code for the errors. Rename the variables and names from errors to old form data. That's it! The final step is to update our template to use these variables. Open the register template. Scroll to the email input. We can add a default value to an input by using the value attribute. Set the value attribute to an expression. The expression will be the old form data email variable. Just like that, the input should have the previously filled in value. It's possible for this variable to not exist in our data. In that case, let's apply the nullish coalescing operator to set the value to an empty string. Lastly, let's wrap the value with the escape function to prevent an XSS attack. 
Let's do the same for the age input. Set the value attribute to the old form data age variable. After the age input, we have the country field. Unlike the other two inputs, this input is using the select element. A field can be pre-selected by adding an attribute called selected. By default, the first option is selected if a field is not selected. Let's add ternary operators to the other two options. Add an expression from within the option element. Add the following value, old form data country equals equals Mexico question mark selected colon empty string. We're using a ternary operator. A ternary operator allows us to perform a conditional check on the left side of the question mark character. If the condition evaluates to true, the value to the right of this character gets returned from the expression. Otherwise, the value to the right of the colon character is returned as a default value. In this example, we're checking if the country variable is equal to Mexico. If it is, we'll output the selected attribute. Otherwise, nothing should appear in the element. The last option element is going to have a similar expression, except the comparison will be for Canada. Perfect. Let's move on to the next input, which is for the social media URL. Similar to the other inputs, set the value attribute to the old form data social media URL variable. Afterward, we have the fields for the passwords. It's considered bad practice to pre-fill the passwords. Passwords contain sensitive information. Rendering that information on the page can expose our users to vulnerabilities. It's best to allow users to fill out these fields again. Let's keep them empty. The last field is the checkbox. We can tick a checkbox by adding an attribute called checked. Just like the option elements, let's add an expression to verify the TOS field was checked. Use the following expression from within the input element. Old form data TOS question mark checked colon empty string. We're finished. Let's try testing our work by switching to the browser. In the browser, try partially filling out the form. We're going to leave some fields empty. After partially filling out the form, submit it. As you can see, the fields filled in continue to have their values. Users won't have to waste time filling out these fields. They can focus on invalid fields. Awesome! We've successfully pre-filled the fields. In the next lecture, we're going to address one more problem with our form before moving on to databases. In this lecture, we're going to make one more modification to our registration form. Previously, we pre-filled the inputs with the values from a previous form submission. During this process, we decided not to pre-fill the password fields for security reasons. However, just because we're not filling in the fields, doesn't mean our templates don't have access to the original password values. Let me show you what I mean. In your editor, open the register template. Below the form element, add an expression with the dump function. We're going to dump the old form data variable. Next, head over to the browser. We're going to fill out the password fields with random values. After doing so, submit the form. Looking closely at the variable, the values from both password fields are being logged. Despite not using them in our form, our templates have access to this information. I don't think this information should be accessible if we don't plan on using them. Let's update our middleware to exclude the passwords from being exposed to our template. In your editor, open the Validation Exception Middleware class. First, to keep our code clean, let's store the form data in a variable before storing it in a session. Before the session variables, create a variable called old form data. Its value will be the post variable. Next, let's provide a list of keys that should be removed from this array. Define a variable called excluded fields. In this array, let's define two keys called password and confirm password. We're using the names assigned to the inputs. In the future, we may want to exclude additional fields. For now, this list of fields will suffice. 
Let's start removing them from the form data. To find one more variable called formatted form data. Its value will be a function called array difference key. This function accepts two arrays. Both arrays are merged into a single array. During this process, if both arrays have similar keys, those keys are excluded from the new array. Let's pass in the old form data variable. Next, we're going to pass in the excluded fields variable with the array flip function. The excluded fields variable is an array with numeric indexes. The list of fields are stored as values. We need to flip the values into key names. That's what the array flip function does to our array. We're flipping the values and keys before passing in the array to the difference function. The last step is to update the session variable. Set the old form data variable to the formatted form data variable. We're finished. Let's try testing our form again. Switch over to the browser. Once again, try filling out the form with values of the password fields. After doing so, submit the form. As you can see, the passwords are no longer appearing in our template. That's exactly what we were hoping for. After about two hours, we finished the registration form. There are other things I'd like to do, but I think it's time to move on to inserting the user into our database. Before moving on, let's remove the dump function from the template. In your editor, remove this line of code. After removing this line of code, we can move on to the next section. I'll see you there.